All right. So are we ready? I think we got everything set. All right. So not going to make this super fancy. Everyone, thanks for coming on today and especially Ian Stepler for coming on. We've talked about doing this for at least 10 months, maybe a year and scheduling and all that kind of stuff. Finally got it done. There's a lot of reasons why we felt like we needed to do this. One, because we're both beekeepers. One, because we both have YouTube channels. We both really- because it sounds super fun. It sounds super fun. (laughs) We both are terrible with technology and we both have a a decent split in the front of our teeth. So, you know, between all of those factors, we have a lot of similarities. Uh, uh, You know what my daughter told me about the split in the front of our teeth? He said that used to be sexy back in the 1700s. They actually used to drive a wedge in between the teeth. Just, you know, it was something to be- admired back in the 1700s so there you go <laughs> oh well i'll rest on that one <laughs> <laughs> i don't know how i don't know how to follow that one um well, <laughs> that's that's what attracted you to me was the split in my front two teeth for sure but getting a getting to the beekeeping stuff that's hilarious and see that's why you have to be careful with these uh, jokes that i start these things with because you never know when the person you're talking to is going to follow it up with <laughs> something <laughs> like that that's great uh, so anyways, um, I have a couple questions for you myself, and then I've got several from folks around the country and some of them in Canada. My first question is, um, what got you into doing a YouTube video channel uh, originally? Because obviously you've got a lot going on with your farm and the bees and stuff. So what, what motivated you to think that um, that would be either helpful to others or helpful to yourself or both? Boy, um, where do I start, right? Um, basically, how, how in-depth do you want me to get on that? See, However it, much actually, I'm wearing to. a shirt. This shirt here, Be Better at Kelowna. These guys, Jeff Lee and Rudy Peters from um, BC, the BC Hunting Producers, they contacted me because they wanted me to come out and speak to their um, membership in their convention. They had somebody fall out on, because of health reasons. So they had an opening and, and we kind of knew each other on social media and all this kind of stuff. So they're bugging me and bugging me to come out to uh, speak at their convention. And there is no way in hell I was gonna go out there and speak because I'm not someone who speaks in front of crowds. You know, it's it just, I don't do public sp- speaking is just something I don't do so I kept <clears throat> telling him to bugger off and finally they wore me down and I said yes and I posted it on Facebook just so I couldn't back out of it and I was sitting on the couch that evening and I had a panic attack because I was like holy what am I going to do like I'm going to be standing in front of 300 people speaking I've like i I have trouble speaking in front of five people. I said, how the hell am I going to get this figured out? So that next day, what I did is I wanted to figure out how I sounded and how other people would hear me, right? <clears throat> so what I did is I walked out to my bee yard and I talked about the only thing I really know about is farming and specifically bees. So I took my cell phone like this and I took a little... Got a little hiccup there. We may experience some technical difficulties, folks, just FYI. Um, the connection from USA to Canada is not always the best, but it'll, it'll clear up here in a second. I finally took a take, was, uh, 10 takes later, I finally got a take. And I thought, well, I got to get this online because I got to make sure that the crowd can hear what I talk like what I sound like so what I did is I put it onto a YouTube channel and then I shared that YouTube video on Facebook just to you know I wanted to provide a little bit of exposure of me talking just so when I stood up in front of the audience the first thing they didn't say was like this is Ian Stepler like what the hell like so I wanted that introduction before I got introduced kind of deal so that is kind of the genesis of the whole thing as that got started and as I went, I just made more in videos, practicing, speaking as if I was talking in front of the crowd and had the convention. 
um, did all right, did okay, met lots of cool people there. It, it was, I, Sandy and I had a lot of fun come back and I just kept making the videos and just kept putting them on my YouTube channel. And yeah, so there's, there's a, the start of it all. Well, I mean, that's, I was just always curious on um, kind of what there's always something or someone that kind of, you know, obviously there's some differences between you and I, but definitely when it comes to technology, neither one of us is very inclined to spend a lot of time with it. Um, <laughs> I avoid it at all costs, and here we are utilizing it. Um, if it wasn't for law, I know social media. Social media is quite the interesting beast. I mean, there's a lot of bad things about social media, but there's a lot of good things too. I mean, just being able to connect with people. There's a lot of lot of positives, definitely for sure. I wish uh, if I think if our news media would just focus on the uh the positives uh, would be a lot better into anything like this just you know reaching out and looking mm -hmm. for new ideas and just you know how to keep bees so now you can go online you can see just loads of this kind of stuff and you can kind of pick the guys that kind of suit your area suit your management style and it i think it's it's really good for the beekeeping community because we're such a small group and this social media has kind of brought us all together in a way and i, I find that really interesting well it really has changed a lot of thoughts down here in the South as well. It's impacted the South because reading a lot of the bee literature, when I got into beekeeping, I love to read. That's one thing that um, I do for fun. I, I love to learn more and reading is my way to get it. And reading a lot of the literature from this area, we're supposed to be overwintering in double deeps in this area. It just It's double deeps and it's doubles. I mean, that's, that's, that's all there is for most of the information. But the reality of it is, is people like you and Michael Palmer and, and others have, have shown that, hey, you know, there, there are people who are doing it in much tougher regions than Tennessee, doing it in singles, doing it in nucleus colonies, and getting that education from other places that are more extreme uh, does impact areas that aren't as extreme and uh, help us decide what there's nothing to do. There's nothing wrong with managing in double deeps either right it's all it all works it just depends on what you're trying to achieve mm -hmm. like we are targeting very specific conditions up here which which uh kind of lead down the path of managing into single boxes where i could see a lot of beekeepers <clears throat> especially further south and especially the pollination type units where double deeps is almost mandatory so it is you know one way or the other it doesn't really make any difference to me. It just depends on what conditions you're trying to target and what you're trying to achieve at the end of that. And if a beekeeper knows what they want to achieve from those hives, then the, uh, the path on, on how you manage it just, it just becomes crystal clear. Then you see all these options and then you just choose whichever way you want to go. I notice you're dabbling with single deeps too. I am. I've probably got somewhere around a hundred in singles and the rest in doubles. And here it's so mild it really i keep trying to figure out what would be better for me every time i try the singles a little bit more i find that it doesn't really make that big of a difference but we're going to be brooding pretty decently in february and we're going to need to throw those brood chambers on in you know march if it's a good colony we're definitely gonna have to add that second deep on anyways and then our summers which we have the dearth period from mid-june to mid-August, we're wanting to feed the colony but not backfill the brood nest and having that headspace above, they can just pack that away. And I'm leaving the ex excluders on this year on a lot of colonies, even though our honey production is long over with, I'm just leaving it on there. So any of the extra syrup goes up top, still leaves that queen below. And then I can focus on making splits in August. I have a bunch of splits that Laurel and I made in August that just look exactly how I want them. Most, almost all of those are in singles, but they are really nice eight frames with the frame feeder. And, uh, but still just, uh, prior to seeing videos like yours, the, the common knowledge around here was it needed to be a double deep. And why was that? I'm, because it needed to be a double. I'm actually, deep. I'm actually one of the biggest reasons why beekeepers up here. Well, the second I taking this, honey crop that's one of the reasons why we're managing singles because we want to take it all away but 
one of the main driving, even guys wintering outside up here are starting to switch to the single box management. And the biggest reason is because of treatment efficacy. It just holds the bees tighter and those mites can't get away from the treatment as easy. And we're putting two strips down there and it uh, really forces the bees to mingle around those strips. Um, and then we're also starting to dabble with oxalic acid type treatments where we're, um, the, you know, providing a vapor within the colony. I think I've seen you do that also. Mm -hmm. And just a smaller cavity seems to allow that oxalic acid to penetrate the cluster better. I'm actually seeing on Facebook and such, you know, I snoop around Facebook, everybody's accounts just to see what they're doing. And I'm actually seeing um, some big time pollination units like migratory beekeepers down there. You guys have migratory beekeeping we don't have up here, uh, not to that extent, <clears throat> but guys are bringing their hives up to the north northern area to collect the honey crop i'm noticing them managing them down into the single box and taking them back down to texas just for the very reason of treatment and i think that whole shift to the single box is more so driven to tre treatment efficacy and just ease of use and and, and, mm -hmm. and shipping around and such and that's one thing that i've been tinkering around with this year is just seeing what is more efficient either with the ape of our it, obviously our season's very different and our mite loads can get phenomenally higher. Yours can still get very high left unchecked, but they just multiply every brood cycle. And the more times that they can multiply, obviously the bigger they get. Um, so, so, something is not breaking that cycle or cutting them back. And down here, just trying to figure out, what for the time is giving me the best results on knocking back the mites, still allowing my bees not to be like, if I use formic acid, very difficult for me because I can't use it between June and early September. It's too hot for the treatment. So just uh, you know, different changes again from location to location, but I am tinkering more and more of into that area of keeping the bees more hemmed to a smaller section or at least creating a small brood break with queen cells and then dropping some type of treatment in there because it, it, it really makes a difference here um, as well. Got a couple questions for you, Ian, from some of, uh, I think our mutual subscribers for the most part. So first off, we do have um, a lot of common, uh, common viewers in our channel. That I watch, I, I, I always go through the comment section of the, on your videos and read all it because it just find comments really interesting between beekeepers. And I see a lot of common names making comments in your videos. So I think, you know, like I was saying, our, our little family is nice and tight together. <laughs> well, the, the information is, is fairly similar, um, which basically boils down to work. A lot of it. I mean, if you, I think if you had to put it down to one word um, it, it's mostly work and and also thinking really hard from time to time which is also work uh but yeah i see a lot of those similar people um, on yours as well and um, a lot of them have become friends of mine whether it's just virtually and some of them i have been fortunate enough to meet them um, and this one's from a fellow named tony west and he's asking what is your opinion on five frame nucleus colonies versus six frame nucleus colonies Oh, I'm in love with six frame nukes. Are you catching my, I'm, my internet's kind of failing. Are you hearing me? Every now and then it slips just a little bit. Okay. And you're uh, good. Yeah. My internet service, I have to apologize. It's just terrible up here. We're just, ugh. we have an internet feed coming into the farm and then we share it between uh, five houses. So like we have a 90 foot tower and it comes in. And we share it. And I told my brothers to stay off the internet for the next hour because I'm on a <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a YouTube channel here talking. So I think they're off. I don't know. If it's, a lot of the time they don't listen to me. But uh, yeah, six frame nukes. I'm in love with six frame nukes. Um, fives, uh, they're easy to handle. Just <clears throat> six frame has that one more frame, right? So one more frame of feed, one more frame of brood, maybe a little more space for pollen. You know, I slap three of them together and I build them up into two boxes on top. So they have shared space and the six frames fit just absolutely perfectly to two honey boxes up on top. So everything's nice and symmetrical where my fives, they're really tight because I put five frames in them. Some guys only run four, but I don't. So I put five and so the frames are tight and the bees are tight and 
and maybe you know they might get honey bound a little bit easier maybe they don't have that little bit of extra brood they need to get through winter and you slide two of those together and put a honey box up on top and it's just a little more sloppy because there's space on the side and i don't know so i've really grown to uh, you know I've, i use those six frames and they just seem to be so much better although <clears throat> i mean those it doesn't matter what uh, configuration you use it just depends on what you're trying to achieve from it right so i'm building these nukes and i'm not really building them for any other reason than to uh, raise that queen for next year okay so I, I build these nukes i haven't made it out um and i put them into the honey flow and i put boxes up on top they share it and i re only reason why i do that is just to maintain the, the nukes so i don't have to work with them so all the surplus honey it goes straight up and I can harvest that off. I also make nukes in like a single deep boxes because I run out of equipment and they're spectacular too you know it's, so it's, it's just whatever piece of equipment you have. Well one thing that going along with that that I've learned from watching your channel is just the value of efficiency and just how really having like one pallet with those six frames on it and being able to use the honey supers on top and be able to pick up that pallet and stack that on other, you know, one of them, you know, not that big of a deal, but as you multiply that throughout your work week and especially over your season, it really cuts down on the workload and Laurel and I are working on our, our operation, finding ways to be more efficient like that, because especially in the heart of the season, you're just, you just can't fall behind any more than you any you do anyways. It's just so frustrating whenever you do get behind and you just, you got to have everything going for you that you can and that efficiency, especially during the middle of the season. I can't even imagine running what you all do. Um, but yeah, we're, we're trying to do that yeah. as well. It's all about, it's all about facility, setting up your facility. And a lot of ways when you get into beekeeping, you got, like for me anyways, when I had a few hundred hives, I'm dabbling with a whole bunch of different ideas. And, you know, then I end up having a whole bunch of different styles of hives and such. And then finally I make my decision, this is what I'm going to do. And this is the direction I'm going to invest my money into. So you almost have to marry that idea because once you move forward, once you, you know, invest into all that equipment, you almost got to go for it. Otherwise, I mean, to make a shift away from that, you got to sell that equipment and reinvest, right? So what I did was, uh, well, standard deep is a given just because everything's familiar, right? When you go brood box, a honey box to everything. So everything's standard deep and it all fits into this extracting equipment that you can buy. Then I bought an easy loader and that was a huge shift on my farm. And it's not a really uh, typical shift most beekeepers make. You, you know, as most beekeepers go the um, the forklift, uh, hiring uh, foreign workers, uh, using fume boards or bee blowers, and just kind of that style of beekeeping. I invested into the easy loader, <clears throat> so I had to marry myself to that idea. So that allowed me to move towards. Um, you know, moving my hives on two-way pallets, you know, get up and personal with the, the hives and you move mm -hmm. them onto the truck. Um, and then it allowed me to use escape boards, which, cause and then I can lift all the boxes off the colony, put my empties in, put the escape board in, drop it back down, you know, just little things like that. Uh, invest, uh, investing into strategies like, strategies like that just kind of you go one way or the other, you know what I'm trying to say. And Rolling. they just set up the facility so then other people can come in and help you, right? So that's kind of what I focused my entire management on is, you know, I brought in a cow and extractor. Yeah, I have kids run that thing. It's just an amazing piece of equipment. So I don't have to be, well, I have Carrie uh, managing the honey house, so she's trained, but she has kids working with her to run that. So I don't have to be there. You know, I'm out in the yards. <clears throat> They're working this easy loader. I mean, I run kids on that easy loader. So they're, they're lifting off boxes and they're throwing things in there. It's all about setting up your operation in a way which other people, other people can come in and do the work for you. Like as our, our farm, I remember before we started hiring people in to help us with the rest of the farm, 
we have this grain truck that, you know, you could only start when you kicked the floor this way and you had to pull in the <laughs> choke like that, you know, and you couldn't start the damn thing unless you did all these little tweaks and then you jump in the combine and you had to jimmy this little lever to make sure that didn't plug when you, you went into the crop in a certain way. You, you can't hire people to do your work when you have all these little farmer fixes. So you got to set up your facility in a way that allows people, is, you got to invest into it. You got to invest into your facility to allow people to come in. So that's yeah. the whole secret behind it. Well, and going along with that, you know, a lot of people who have maybe watched my early videos and still see some single um, hives as far as just regular bottom boards. A lot of people have noticed that I'm going to two ways and there's been several things that you've done that have influenced our decision making. There's nobody really around here doing two way pallets on a professional scale. And it's two way pallets are they're they're useless on semis. Like when you're hauling bees large distances like a lot of your migratory beekeepers down there, you gotta go four ways or even, you know, put six onto a pallet just Ooh, because you ways. need to be able to use four <laughs> you got to be able to use forklifts and semis and unload and, and you know standardize the same thing they're standardizing the work so somebody else can come in hey laurel i need a charger for my phone Let's see here put them onto the truck and then pull them off you know i'm not going that large distance so it, it so there you go so, you know those conditions that i'm ma managing my bees are different than the other conditions so i just uh, make sure that i set things whereas people are setting their beekeeping operation up just make sure you set it up for whatever you're trying to do with your bees you know? right and we, we laurel and i don't want to play the the pollination game I, I respect a lot of people who who do that and the families that work really hard um to do that every year um so i mean obviously i like orange juice and uh, I really enjoy almonds and a bunch of things. And it's not to say that there aren't some frustrations that go along with monoculture and stuff like that, but there are some uh, necessities there. And I, my proposal is to the people that um, complain about that the most, um, what solutions do you have to address that? Um, because uh, yeah. there are, there are almonds a lot of is a cash or sorry, almonds is a cash crop. And I mean, without almonds down in the States, I'm looking at a lot of beekeepers make, their living that revolves around that revenue stream is extremely important. Yeah. And it just kind of ties into their whole uh, operation management where they go down to the almonds and make a shit ton of money. And then they come up to the North, pull some honey, then back down to the South and make up some splits. It's uh, it's a really good business strategy. And I can see without the almonds, um, a lot of hardship because without that revenue source, uh, then they're relying on honey. And I, what I see down and, and there's the shifts happening in Canada too, where like we're, we have the luxury of having this huge abundant area of canola right across the prairies. We got canola flowers and that's, that's, that's our cash crop is that canola flow, but it's also being shifted out with other crops like soybeans and corn. And we don't produce honey on that. And I see a lot of soybeans and corn down in the States. So, you yes. know, Soybean, if there's an alternative to that revenue stream of, of uh, almonds, like a cash honey crop, uh, then you'd be fine. But you, you need that almond crop. You need that pollination source down there to keep the business healthy. That leads me into my next question. And right before I get to that, I'd like to say um, thanks to Larry Lee's Bees um, for donating. And um, this is a question by Brad Kendrick. Um, my question is about marketing. What does a commercial beekeeper need to sell his honey for per? per pound to be profitable. How can the industry make more money per pound to compensate you hardworking people for this priceless commodity? And real quick, again, if the almonds up and disappeared, um, it would, it would be devastating to a lot of families. Um, they're not just uh, beekeepers, but also um, a lot of growers and other people that are tied into the pollination game in California. Um, I'm not saying that if some things need to be probably be made safer for the bees while they're out there, um, that would be awesome. But at the same time, uh, commercial beekeepers need this, a lot of them, because the price of honey is being impacted by a lot of these imports. And I'll, I'll let you answer what can the industry do to make uh, things better on the honey market. I'll just start out first off just saying hi to Brad. He, he, uh, <laughs> 
he wanted to spot me some cash because he appreciates the videos or whatever and i wouldn't accept it from him so he went and bought me boxes for my box builder here he <laughs> they pull up to the box builder here to pick up my if he gets a few extra boxes here from a guy that watches your videos <laughs> stubborn, so i thought that was kind of neat <laughs> so i just want to tell you that i used those boxes i filled up filled them up full of honey twice <laughs> that's awesome you know uh, but to the point of to that point of the question um what can somebody do to uh support the honey industry i think that's the, the drift of the question and my uh answer right off the start on that is we have to um I don't want to necessarily say we have to support homegrown um, because, you know, we produce honey, we sell it, it gets exported, it's all cash, but we have to support pure product. Yeah. That's adulterated shit that's out there. It's really hurting us and it's coming from all angles. And, and if the public actually knew that some of that honey was funny honey, they would be horrified. As beekeepers, we have to be very careful too, as we <clears throat> as we complain about this, because we can't. I, f I see on Facebook they're talking about honey and how it's adulterated and it's no good. You got to buy local and all this kind of stuff, and it's and just messaging. and honey <clears throat> and bee made honey is very uh focused on targeting their consumers on the fact that it's 100 percent canadian pure honey and they're not involving that whole narrative of adulteration and all this kind of stuff out there and you know confusing the consumer they're just in their back the consumer's mind they know it's kind of happening anyways but we're providing a pure product by um from producers you know right across canada which we can like be made can connect the producer almost like connect the producer's hive right through the packing right to the retailer right to the cu customer and it's an amazing thing and we're building um a customer base which, which is absolutely beautiful i mean in canada you look a lot of people com complain about on the shelf honey is garbage honey well that's bullshit because a lot of the on the shelf honey in Canada right now is bee made honey. It's just private label, right? So we've got to make sure and how we drive the narrative of this honey, honey, funny honey coming in and just making sure that we're telling the consumer that uh, there's pure product here to buy. If you want to support beekeepers and you want to, you know, consume pure food, then you, you almost got to be, uh, you almost got to take the effort to step ahead and you know figure out where that food's coming from and you know maybe even pay a little bit more for that food that you know that's pure for sure. you know what i'm talking about for sure and but basically if if they just leveled out the playing field i have i really have no problem buying some things out of country um, one of the tools i'm looking to buy right now comes actually from canada and it looks made really well and I, i'm excited about it I have no problem with that. Um, I have a problem with liars and we have a lot of people who are sending stuff from China, Vietnam, Argentina, other countries. And I promise you there's some great beekeepers in those country and probably some of the most delicious honey that you haven't ever tried before, but we're not getting that. We're getting rice syrup, wheat syrup, corn syrup, and maybe a little bit of honey and pollen sprinkled in there to, you know, but I mean, we have the technology. I, I think definitely the capability of catching these people in the process of it. And especially here in the U S um, some of the organizations uh, pride themselves in ensuring that you know, we have the best food safety in the world. But the reality of it is we don't know exactly what we're getting a lot of times. And it, it kind of is interesting to me that I've got dozens of honeys up on this shelf over here from people around the U.S. and a little bit outside of the U.S. and none of them taste the same. Now, obviously, canola honey, bigger crops like that, like you, know, you all produce massive amounts of that. And the clover honey is kind of one of the things they have here in the U.S. Uh, I don't know if they have as much sweet clover up in Canada. Um, do they? They do a lot of sweet we, clover up there. Yeah. 
We have clover everywhere. Yeah, clover complements the canola just beautifully. Nice, and you know, both of them are nice, uh, nice, healthy crops for bees. It's one thing I'm actually looking into is seeing about planting canola here. We have some farms in, in this area, not very big ones because our pastures are very tiny. Most of our pastures in the Jackson County area, if you have an area of 20 to 30 acres that's flat and solid, you have something. Um, we have a lot of hills, a lot of small, narrow valleys, lots of creeks, decent amount of rivers cutting through, and a lot of flooding because of that. So, um, and it's just not really lucrative, as lucrative to plant 20 acres of corn here and an eight acre patch here. And, you know, especially when you're talking millions of dollars worth of equipment like you all um, have, um, and what you really need to be able to justify it at the price that you know, grains are, I mean, unless you can find a way to get some, you know, if you're selling it at some nice price, like, you know, a lot of the beekeepers are doing, you know, like you and I sell our honey differently. You're selling lots of barrels of honey. I, I produce a handful of barrels of honey and I sell mine to stores who then resell it for me. And, you know, we, the, I sell mine for a lot more per pound than you do. You just produce a heck of a lot more poundage and, and going into that, I have a question here from Don Bearden asking um, how many barrels or how much poundage roughly did you produce this year? Yeah, everybody asks me that question. <laughs> uh, it was a pretty good year for us this year. Good. Uh, it was, I'd say, a little bit above average. Um, you remember that cursed snowstorm we had about this time of year last year? The one you kept complaining about a lot? <laughs> Complain to complain to complain. That's the only thing I could do about it. <laughs> but that cursed snowstorm, it uh, recharged our water table on the ground. It was that moisture was actually really needed. It could have come maybe two weeks after when it actually did. But if it wasn't for the, like it recharged the groundwater, it recharged your wells. We had water all winter for our cattle. That next spring, come around we had a hell of a time planting the crops because it, it just the land was in a mess so we had a, we spent a lot of time fixing up the land we so, finally got things fixed up the sowing of the crop was a little bit late because of that we had timely rains come through the spring and the summer but not enough to grow a crop our it was hot so our roots were able to dig deep and they digged right into that snowstorm we had last year and that's what bought me a honey crop so, and, and that's what bought us our crops that we're harvesting right now. We're having a pretty good year this year because of that. With such limited amount of rain, that snow that fell last year actually provided us with a, a little support this year. That's awesome. So I forget how many, uh, I, we, we shipped off the seventh semi-load uh, yesterday and I forget how many drums it is. It's about 455 drums is what we produced. So we're quite happy with that. Most of that is canola honey, but we had a fantastic um, a sunflower crop too. We had two semi loads of sunflower honey this year. And uh, oh man, these sunflowers, they're standing taller than I am in the field. It's just absolutely amazing. We've never yielded so much sunflower before, 3,100 pounds an acre wow. for seed. And, and the honey that come off that, oh man, it, it uh, provided me a, a honey flow that went from end of July, it was pretty much when the canola burnt off, right till second week of August. Uh, the sunflower doesn't flower as long as canola, but it kicked off nectar, man, did it ever. So and one thing I'd like so to that, see that's, more, oh, just go ahead. Oh, okay, I was just, I was just gonna say, we have a bit of a delay, so yeah. it's a little awkward, but, uh, I don't even know what I was going to say. <clears throat> if it wasn't for the bees, um, I don't think we would have had the same type of sunflower crop. Because I'm looking, I was walking through the uh, the field, and I'm looking at the pollination on every one of the heads, and it's damn near perfect pollination every single one of those heads. Walking through the fields, you see like three, four bees on every head. You have bumblebees flying all over the place. So I think the bees complemented the sunflowers and the sunflowers complemented the bees this year. <laughs> well, that, that's awesome. I, it's, a, it's interesting how sometimes frustration uh, can, in the weather can actually lead to beneficial things down the road, but it still doesn't make, it still is frustrating in the moment. I, I definitely have had big red stuck before and, and mud and different things like that. And it's not, those aren't fun days. Um, you know, we don't get the cold weather that you all do in winter time. 
um, but we do get a lot of mud. Um, I mean, that's pretty much what our winters are made out of is, is just mud here. Uh, we, we get plenty of rain. Uh, I think usually we average around 60, 70 inches um, d depending on the year. Um, it's been more wet the last handful of years, but just always, uh, always challenges. But you know, the spring flow this year wasn't that good for us, but kind of the, some of the events that happened in spring actually uh, created a better fall flow for us. Um, not that we really remove a whole lot of honey from that, but it, our bees looked a lot better going into August and September than I've ever had them before, which is still a, a blessing there. So I'd you know, it's not all bad. Um, it's just part of agriculture. And the more time I spend beekeeping or farming or anything like that, the more just realize that um, just sometimes you just got to turn off the weather channel and just get outside and just put on your boots. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, you're, you're, I know you're down in Tennessee and we we're talking the other night, try, I'm trying to pinpoint actually where your farm is. So you're talking your East of Nashville or west of Nashville? Um, I am east of Nashville. It's I'm in Jackson You're County. You're east of Nashville. Yeah, Jackson County, Jackson Tennessee. Jackson County, okay. And uh, it, it's beautiful, um, absolutely beautiful. But um, every now and then you'll see some soybean fields. The farmers around here, there are some that are really good. Um, but for the most part, farming is not a, a kind of part of the culture in this area anymore. It used to be tobacco different things like that. But when I grew up in Indiana, it, it was totally different. I mean, they didn't consider you a legitimate farmer unless you had a you know, few hundred acres at least. Um, you know, it was all flat land up there, soybeans, corn, and uh, oh, look, somebody's doing a little bit of silage over there. Wow, biodiversity at its finest. You know, that's, that's pretty much all the land that we had around us. Um, down here, we have just weeds and weeds and trees and lots of pollen um, during the, the peak part of the season. So um, it's, it's really beautiful. Not the best beekeeping country, um, not the best farming country, but it, it, it's still really nice. And it's, it's far away from the cities, which for me is, that's the way I like it. So let's. Uh, I want to, uh, so I, I'm going to show you what I have here. I have a little map. And all my little speaking events and everything, I put a little tack on. So I got to find where you are. Well, it's just a matter of time until we have you here. So if you look at Nashville, we are on that little map. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Yeah, there's Nashville there. With just a slight bit to so the you drive. So, so you got a pin. All right. That kind of hurt a little so bit. So I call that, that's my map. <laughs> that's my map of accomplishment. That's, you know, we were talking a little earlier about speaking and such and going to all these venues and speaking, public speaking. I find these speaking things are an accomplishment for me. So that's why I'm doing that. These are all the places I've been or spoke to. It's amazing. That this year set. I've been, I've been planned. I've, I was set up to go to quite a few places down the States. This actually, uh, starting on Thursday and then I have another four or five places lined up but because of COVID everything's been shut down that way so I'm doing a lot of online presentations so this is really uh, a different medium for me I'm not really familiar at all with it other than doing business on some Zoom meetings uh, with the association like this but uh, this is really good practice for me actually because I'm going to be speaking in front of a lot of people about bees <laughs> maybe it might, it might <laughs> all across ruin the you. world actually <laughs> Uh, it, might, it might ruin you actually uh you'll be you'll be cutting jokes uh, and the next one and the other guy will be dead serious he won't even crack a smile that, that, really throws, <laughs> I, that really throws me for a loop when somebody can't smile at all it always messes with me but uh i've got one coming up uh next week and it's really different they're having me take five videos that they've selected on topics that they wanted and i've got to play the videos and then listen to myself talk through my nose Oh, sweet. And, and then explain what I'm doing, which I thought that's kind of what the video was for. Um, but no, seriously, <laughs> just break it down a little bit further. I, it's going to be really interesting to do that. And um, I'm, I'm excited to do it. But yeah, this uh, this COVID thing is has changed a lot. Um, but there, there's always some positives, even out of some negative things. And um, just make the most of what you have. That's farming right there. Um, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yep. I, there's some venues you're noticing my internet service is probably really shitty because I'll cut out here and I'm, I, 
if you see me cut out here, just keep talking because I eventually come back. <laughs> okay. But the, these venues that got me speaking at the convention online, they they like I've touched base with them on Zoom here, and they are like, oh damn, like what if you cut out while your presentation? So some of these ones, I'm pre-recording my presentation and then showing up live uh, afterwards to answer questions and such. So I think that's going to be a, a good mix of the two. That way they can plan their convention a lot more fluidly and not have to worry about crappy internet connection, but then still get that live um, connection, that live experience at the end of it. Some are going that way. Other ones are just throwing the dice and hopefully, hopefully my internet holds through. Yeah. Just get, get the whole family to stay um, off of it. And maybe you'd be all right. <laughs> yeah. 10 years ago, ag development come through <clears throat> the area and, and surveying all the farmers. We had a, you know, some kind of a meeting in Miami. Say what do you guys need to become prosperous for agriculture in Manitoba, Southern Manitoba. And we had all these ideas. We we're giving a list of all these things that we needed. And, and one of the uh, comments from the floor was, well, we need high speed internet. And I remember distinctly as staying beside my brother and we we're saying, what the hell do we need high speed internet for? I mean, we're farming. We don't need high speed internet, right? But we do all our business online now. We sell bulls, like we're pre-bred uh, Charlotte. <clears throat> we sell breeding stock right across the country. We have a bull sale and guys tune in from all around the world for this thing. We have breeding, like we sell semen down into uh, New Zealand, Australia. Wow. Um, we've got connection of buyers everywhere. And this is all online. So, you know, the internet is extremely important. It's becoming more and more important as we go. And this shitty connection I have right now <clears throat> is pretty good if, from what we had before, but uh, we're going to be getting a fiber optic coming through just to help us with that feed. You'll and that's really going to help like us that. step into that next level. You'll really like that, especially I, I, yeah, loading just, your videos. Um, how long does it take you to load some of those long videos? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if it's a half hour video, it's, you know, it'd be like three hours. So I usually do that at night. So I'm not interrupting the, the internet usage, uh, that the rest of the family needs to use on the same line. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, yeah. that's, that's funny. Uh, what we're definitely going to, at some point, I've been talking to several people in this state and, uh, you know, nearby states, and, uh, we're going to do our very best to get you down here as soon as, uh, the season and, uh, the whole situation with the COVID thing um hopefully goes down soon and that would that would be awesome a lot of people that would be a lot of fun we got a lot of i cool will stuff. warn you one thing though i'll warn you about one thing <clears throat> that i don't travel without my wife <laughs> so if you're gonna book me it's got to be tickets for two because <laughs> i don't get on two. that plane without my wife <laughs> well, i did that once let me tell you that's <laughs> that's the last time i i went to hawaii one time on a business trip to visit my friend zach heinzelman out there and uh, get some a uh, little bit more experience because he, he raises just thousands and thousands of queens year round down there in the big island and uh it i just oh, told yeah, Laurel, i'm like i'm just i'm just going down there to work uh, you know there's not really not we're not, not going to be spending any time for you know having fun and we really didn't i pretty much worked 99 percent of the time helping him with his operation and also learning stuff as well and, but let me tell you ian don't ever go to Hawaii without your wife. You will never live it down. You'll regret every second of that trip. Uh, uh, I imagine so. Sandy never complains at all about being dragged along to these bee conventions. She has a blast. She just loves, <clears throat> she, she, my wife, Sandy, she's not really involved with the bees, mostly because she's deadly allergic to bees, but huh. she loves every aspect about uh, beekeeping and she loves when we go around to all these conventions and she gets to talk with these beekeeper wives and uh, like she's a farm wife so she's very connected to the farm and just uh, meeting other people and she's and I mean she gets a free trip out of it with just with her husband and not have any kids you know we have five kids so she's she's five pretty kids. busy <laughs> I, I was I was gonna ask yeah. you kids take a, a lot of time and uh, you know the way, the way I look at it with all that she has to put up with the least you know, she, you could do is take her on a trip with you, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, well, I would love to, to meet her and, you know, probably um, between her and Laurel, they'd have hours and hours of horrible stories to tell each other about us. Um, but <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. we could share them all at the pub after the, uh, the presentations, right? <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's right. actually, you know what? That's the best thing I like about um, 
conventions. Like I'm convention chair of the association back here in Manitoba. <clears throat> and we invite speakers in from all around North America. So we like pulling guys out from the Southern states and we like call, pulling guys from California and, and across Canada. And the, and the one thing, <clears throat> um, I was given a piece of advice uh, before I become convention chair and the guy told me, he said, if you become convention chair, make sure you are the guy that picks up the, the, the speakers at the airport. Because he told me, I said, well, why does it matter? He said, well, you are the first contact to these speakers and then you can book supper with them that evening. I think you're <laughs> the one organizing the supper event. My favorite part about these conventions is the evening after the convention is done because these guys are a little bit stressed they're talking about science or whatever work they're doing or experience and they're a lot of them aren't comfortable talking in front of crowd just like i'm not <clears throat> and after the convention's done they kind of loosen their tie and drink a few beers and that is probably my favorite time of the entire event is just you know casual conversation over a few beers after all the work is done so i'm really enjoying going around meeting all these beekeepers because half the time uh well i can't remember half the beekeepers i meet but uh, there are certain beekeepers right across the country into all these conventions that you kind of latch on to and and i you know you keep touch with them and it just the connection of that network starts to form and it's an amazing thing you especially you see it when uh like i'm organizing these conventions you, and i'm going to conventions like i can see that research network where all these universities are pouring money into research and you have all these people, you know, investing their time and their knowledge into our craft. And I just find it so fascinating <clears> that everybody goes to these conventions and everybody gets invited all over the place. And these researchers are using these conventions to network and they're meeting other, other people connect with bees. And then they go to another convention, convention, meet somebody else. And then they meet the, the other two people and everybody is just forms into this, incredible web which you're kind of fostering for us and as beekeepers i just think we need to acknowledge that a little bit better <clears throat> and as beekeepers i think we need to you know create the function to be able to extract some of that brilliance that those guys are creating for us and just bring it down to the beekeeper level because there's a tremendous amount of brilliance out there you watch and you listen to these guys talk and it just blows your mind it really gets you excited but then you go back down to your apron and you're like well where the hell is it like where am i seeing it here so we just have to beekeepers i think we need to help ourselves a little better just to be able to develop the function to be able to grab some of that you know research and innovation and translate it down into what we're doing because we don't have <clears throat> pharmaceuticals or we don't have big egg making a lot of money on us which would take that like in other sectors in the farm and the grain from the cattle farm there's a lot of guys make money on us and they're taking all that academic and they're putting it in they're you know creating these tools which and then they sell to the farmer and it's absolutely brilliant and it's it's, it's contributed to the wealth of our farm and just i see that disconnect in the beekeeping industry because there's mm -hmm. not as much money to be made on us so that just means that we as beekeepers have to maybe support efforts to be able to you know bring that some of that down ourselves or maybe yeah. promote some more of that uh, give us more tools yeah money money definitely is a, a always a factor in research and funds and how much attention that the industry gets I, again I, going along with what you've said i think beekeepers working together whether it's with scientists or other beekeepers that collaboration has really been invaluable i know that i have learned more over the last three or four years than i learned in the 13 years prior. And a lot of it has to do with collaborating with the right people. Um, also looking in the right areas and relationships, you know, as a, a teenager, um, my dad used to say this a lot. Life is all about relationships. And as a teenager, I, I really just kind of, you know, one in one ear out the other, but it really is very true. Um, whether it's working for someone, whether it's having someone work for you, networking through a B conference, whatever. And it's not that every relationship pans out to be beneficial to you or beneficial to them, but it, it does add up. We All of us come in contact with who, who knows how many people in our lives. And uh, those relationships amount to, I think, a, a lot, um, especially if we foster those. And it's kind of like a, a hive of bees. One bee by itself is incredibly weak and fragile. I, I can't imagine, I mean, could you imagine 
you know, going to a tree in the middle of the woods, cutting it down and trying to all of a sudden start beekeeping without any education at all. How long? I mean, obviously it's taken thousands and thousands of years for us to get to where we're at and to isolate ourselves from one another because obviously you're busy doing what you're doing. You can't do a lot of the science stuff that maybe someone like, uh, you know, full-time scientists can do obviously. And, and one scientist can't do it all. So that, that collaboration is what I think makes a strong beekeeping economy. And to me, it's not about anymore, especially with the, the internet and stuff like that. It's not just, okay, what are they doing in the U S um, you know, we, we have such easy access to Canadian beekeepers, uh, Sw Swedish beekeepers, um, even other countries. Now you can Google translate. It's, it's insane. Um, all the, it, it, we have more opportunities and education at our fingertips than we've ever had in the history of mankind. And yet, um, a lot of people are complaining that there's no opportunities. I find that hard to believe. Um, but getting out of that and into the next question, um, Mike Curran asks, what is a, what is good to add in totes to, into your totes to float to float and to prevent drowning bees. My internet just cut out there. You're asked the question is talking about uh, floats in my feeding totes. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. <clears throat> that is uh, yeah. So you know you open feed and you get drowning bees. So that's the last thing we want to see is dead drowning bees. So basically, floats is it can it floats is a big part of it, but I, I think a bigger part of it is surface area. So you know you get too many bees in a small space, and they're hungry, and they start fighting to get down into that syrup. And then you you know one starts to drown. What's the first thing any animal does when it starts to beside them and pulls them down too? And it and you know then you just end up with this huge mess of wet drowned bees. So what I found works the best uh, before you even consider floats is making sure that you provide enough actual surface area to be able to allow the bees easy access to that syrup so they're not fighting and they're not drowning and they're not pulling each other down. And I found the magic number for me anyways in the fall right after the honey flow is done these hives are full of bees there are lots of bees there so lots of foragers i find that magic number is four of those totes or no what is the number um 10 hives for every tote so i have yards of 40 so i have four totes in a yard and that seems to provide enough surface area to you know um, allow the bees access to the sugar without them having to fight for it the other thing i do is I provide floats in there for them. Uh, Joe May had come up with this really neat uh, cheesecloth idea. I never actually tried that. I, I keep meaning to do it. But what I do is I put, it's very basic and simple. I just break some sticks off, <clears throat> excuse me, just break some sticks off the trees around, throw the sticks into the tub. And then I throw oat straw or wheat straw up on top of that. Just, you know, the sticks hold the straw up and then the bees, you know, climb down the straw on the stick and just drink the syrup. So it, it works very well. Nice and simple. I'm all about simplicity. Going into that, um, we had a question about, do you put anything into your syrup? And also uh, going into those totes, what, what thickness of syrup are you using? Two to one syrup thickness as in like straight sucrose. What's the, the ratio for that? And that is um, from Jason. Okay. Uh, I've never fed anything other than two to one. I, I buy my, I used to mix syrup a long time ago, but then I got tired of that. So then I buy it from Be Made as sucrose or fructose. Uh, I get it by the semi load now. It comes from Rogers. It's, it's a sugar beet sh uh, syrup. And it comes as two to one and I put it in the tank. I never dilute it. I know a lot of beekeepers will because they figure it helps stimulate brooding and all this kind of stuff, but I've never really bothered diluting syrup. I've always, you know, you start watering down the syrup and you got to make sure it gets consumed right away because uh, I don't want any type of fermentation problem. So I just find two to one is much easier to handle. So I primarily I feed uh, two to one syrup. And as for additives, uh, 
I don't add anything to my syrup except, you know, I'm kind of collaborating with this beekeeper out uh, east and he's, he's got me at putting this, you know, nutrients and, and, and stuff in it. We call it rocket juice. And, and it, it seems to, it's all about adding nutrition and just kind of fortifying the health of the bee, just trying to make the syrup more familiar to uh, if they're bringing in nectar or you're consuming honey. But other than that, I don't add any essential oils or any medications or anything like that. I'm just a, I'm a believer of just simply sugar. Other than um, if I have leftover syrup in the spring and I'm trying to keep it over and I don't want it to mold on me or something, I might put some honeybee healthy and just kind of glug it in the top of the tank just to prevent that mold layer from forming in the top. And that seems to help with the mold. I don't use bleach. I'm a firm believer against bleach. And uh, I, so I just use this honeybee healthy uh, up on top just to help prevent that mold from forming, mm -hmm. just to help carry that syrup a little bit further. Well, it's all, a, yeah. the syrup is not cheap. It definitely is not. And you got to make it last and ideally um, getting in there as fresh as possible is, is best. But sometimes things happen. Maybe the, the truck gets stuck and has to sit in the tank a little bit longer, all that kind of stuff. But uh, one thing yeah, that we got to be careful uh, just on the topic of syrup and feeding syrup. Um, Dr. Rob Curry out of the University of Manitoba here has done a lot of research yeah. on feeding syrup and age of syrup and just the quality of syrup that you want to feed your bees. And the most important thing for a beekeeper to do and feeding his winter colonies, whether it's fruc fructose or sucrose, is making sure it's fresh. Because mm. whether it's fructose, especially fructose, fructose degrades really quickly. The HMF on it uh, escalates quickly. It's not a bad uh, sugar for bees, but it's just if you're feeding it and if it, it, it'll degrade a lot quicker than sucrose. But sucrose will also degrade over time. And, there, and he's doing some research and he was showing that uh, the syrup that's sat for a length of time fed to a winter colony will do more poorly than if you feed it, you know, fresh syrup. And that's, you know, it seems like common sense, right? But I catch myself doing it all the time too, is I have leftover syrup in the spring and I hold it over summer and it sits in the sun or it sits in the in a shed or whatever. And and then I end up feeding it in for winter feed and, and in a way I'm probably doing myself harm. So what I've started doing and uh, through his advice too, is that if you are going to have old syrup, so the best thing to do is to hold it over winter for next spring because that old syrup is not as detrimental to a springtime colony because they can fly it off, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have to feed it, just like this spring, I had like, I, I had half a semi load at, 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 held over and I'm not going to waste it. It's worth a lot of money. So he says, if you have to feed that, then he says dilution is the solution on that. So what you want to do is he, he specifically said like eight parts of fresh syrup to one part of older syrup, as long as it's not, it's not sour or fermented, if it's just old. So that's that's kind of how I use my older type syrup up now, is I make sure that if I'm feeding it as winter feed that I dilute it off to make sure I have a real good complement of uh, fresh syrup for that winter feed. So that's the most important thing if you ask me for anybody feeding is to make sure that you control the quality of the syrup, of the feed source is extremely important, especially for us, because we're just about to head into winter and we're not gonna, not gonna come out until April. And these bees are gonna be stuck in that box for five, five and a half months. And we gotta make for damn sure that they have the highest quality feed in those boxes to be able to allow them to endure this type of winter. Maybe down around uh, like in, around Tennessee, your bees will, won't be confined as long. So they'll have more opportunity to fly it off. So an older syrup maybe isn't as detrimental but up here where we're experiencing these terrible long winters and sometimes we have springs that just linger on and on like last spring, then you got to make sure that these colonies have everything they need within that nest. That's top quality, high performing, you know? Yeah. And it's just, uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that. That was actually one of the questions um, that folks were asking and, and he did a great job on that presentation, just laying out a lot of the factors and it really was an eye opener because down here, in, in the South, things are very different. That doesn't mean that it's not chipping away at the percentages of the bees. I know several beekeepers in the mid part of the state who get really inexpensive syrup in barrels periodically. And some of them 
purchase so much they're, they're using this stuff five and six years later and we get like a hundred and something degrees a lot in summer especially in sheds very you know it, it's hot from you know sometimes april all the way into late september so you know, just not ideal conditions for syrup and yes we do especially in a mild year we'll have cleansing flights every couple of weeks um, in a mild year, you know, so our bees are able to get out and let her fly if they need to, but still um, who knows what else could be happening to the colony. It could retard their early spring jump start to, to get that brood going on. Who knows? Maybe it's lowering the population. I don't, I don't know, but it's always best to keep it fresh. And this kind of goes into it as well. Um, how much has wintering indoors improved your overall winter success rate compared to doing it outdoors? That's uh, that's a good question. And that's something I can't really pinpoint. Like my neighbor right beside me here manages 1500 hives, whatever, very similar beekeeping style to me. He actually has an easy loader. He does everything with skateboards. We're pretty much exactly the same beekeeper. beekeeper except he winters his singles outside and he seems to be doing very well. The reason why I moved my hives inside though, it's all about perf personal preference. I'm a bit of a, con a control freak in a little way. <laughs> I like to, you know, so it's, you know, middle of January and it's minus 35 and there's a howling wind. I like to have in the back of my mind that my hives are inside in a climate controlled building and there's as something I'm doing to help them get through that winter, whether or not it's actually helping them, I don't know, but it's, you know, it's an effort I'm putting towards uh, my hives to get them through. So it seems to be, it seems to help my peace of mind <clears throat> in that way. But <clears throat> the other thing, the other reason why I started wintering inside is because well, there's two reasons. So the one reason was I hated in the spring unwrapping my colonies and the wraps are all covered in mouse piss. And just, you know, one time I opened up my winter wrap and there's a bloody skunk right there. It's like, ah, get, you know, get away. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't keep the road inside of my wraps and they just kept tearing it apart. And I just kept having to buy new wraps all the time and bring it in. It's just, so I said, enough of that guys up here have been wintering since you know the late 80s it's not anything that i invented or anything like that <clears throat> it's a management practice i adopted and it just seemed very logical for me i have this easy loader i can easily pick up my colonies i can i have forklifts i can bring everything stack them up but the other the other reason is i started to uh shift my management Got a little bit of a hiccup there. He'll be back in one second. Uh, I'm building Great. lots of nukes. So I'm building lots of small little units. And small units in really cold winter maybe sometimes don't manage the winter as well. So, you know, I'm wintering these units inside a climate controlled building, which it's predictable. Um, I know if, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is, it, by wintering smaller units in a climate control building just provided more predictability of the outcome from that winter. Mm -hmm. When you winter outside up here, sometimes you get snow, sometimes you don't, you get wind, you get cold, you get ice storms. It, it, it gets, sometimes you get some of these conditions that line up and maybe the hives didn't set up properly for winter, maybe not as well. You get some conditions line up and you guys sometimes will experience a 75% loss and it just like blows you away. We're indoors, you can kind of control some of that more so. There's a lot of disadvantages of managing bees indoors too, which kind of, you know, either makes makes the situation either way. When you're outside, when you're inside, you know, it's just whatever your preferences are. Well, and I just, and that's kind of where it falls into the, the art of beekeeping to a degree. Um, there's definitely beekeepers far north who are doing pretty well consistently kind of like you said that are doing it outdoors but um, you know your system of indoors took you several years to fine-tune and I imagine you're still looking for ways to make it even better than what it is um, at least to a small degree I know I'm always looking at 
you know, ways to improve or understand what's going on better. Maybe it doesn't improve, but just allows me to understand more of the dynamics of what's impacting the colonies. Just, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, especially new beekeepers, and I, I used to be one of them that thought this way, that, you know, nature is just, it, it's this nice natured, you know, just creature that's just trying to help everything out. And that is not the case at all. It is ready to put its Mother nature foot, is a bitch. <laughs> uh, ready to put its foot on the throat, the juggler uh, at any moment. And, you know, the weather might line up and you might have the best bee year you've ever had in the next year it just might drop every hammer and that it's got in the toolbox. And uh, it's just, uh, you just I never will know say, what you're going to get. I will say about uh, wintering doors that you'll notice watching some of my videos, I start, you know, fussing and complaining come March. Our hives have been in, in since November. We typically bring the hives into winter in November, but they've been confined middle of October going on. And you know, the old saying up here is any idiot can winter bees to February. Still, all right. Shape. There we go. We, you got to make sure, am I cutting out there on you? Yeah, you're, you're good now. Go ahead. Okay. You got to make sure that the hives are in pretty good shape coming into March. Um, to be able to get them through March. And it's, you know, it's that little, that end of winter is just, is just too long and the bees are getting runny they want outside. And you, you've got to find the, almost that perfect type of weather uh, to set those bees out in so they can start flying and where they can start developing and get going. But you look at some of these outdoor wintered colonies and in a way they're kind of like Canadians are, they're wint, they're hardy, they're wintered, you know, they're, they're, they, is they've had the jacket all in all winter and they, they're coming to spring and they just accept it and carry on where these these uh indoor wintered colonies are almost like snowbirds coming from the a little bit of cut out there again Maybe it'll fix itself here in a second. Really frustrating. So you'll notice that I'm fussing a lot in the spring and when to set these colonies out and, you know, getting them going and promoting all those, those conditions to be able to get them through that stage is because by confining them for so long that we're kind of really testing the boundaries and what they can actually endure. So we're testing those boundaries and we're making them perform to their very, right to the very edge. Mm -hmm. And it happens perfect most years and, and we can flip them out, get them into spring and it, it can just be a, an amazing thing. But uh, when mother nature, she can throw a curveball at you and we just got to, uh, you know, we just got to try to manage through that. And that's, that's that but it all goes period. with, um, it all goes with uh, good husbandry. You keep uh, your mite control in check. That's the biggest thing. <clears throat> if you're not controlling your mites, your bees are going to die. You're going to provide them good food. If without good food, they're going. Nutrition and Queens. And if you're looking after those three, uh, then uh, you can throw a lot of things at these hives and Getting a lot of, got a lot of feedback right now. Um, let's see here. So, sorry about that. We're just, uh, get, I was, I was getting a little bit of, uh, time, messed up on the timing there a little bit, but I got the general gist. Um, basically the, the three keys, kind of like what we talk about a little bit, you know, great Queens, dead mites and good nutrition. That really goes anywhere that you're at. That's, not all the weather condition, conditions that you have are, are going to be the same that I have, not even close, actually. Um, but if you got a great queen, you got dead mites in the hive, and they've got good nutrition to work with, it's, it's a great recipe for success um, wherever you're at. Um, I have a, a question that's actually for you and for me, Ian. And this one was in relation to um, treatment-free test yards. And 
and what have we ever done those or what we thought of it. And I'll just answer mine really quick is that um, I used to, maybe people haven't watched all my videos, but I used to do quite a bit of treatment free. Um, actually, it was all that I did for several years. And uh, one of my biggest regrets, um, not only financially, but just um, so many hives that I lost unnecessarily. And it's not that there aren't some friends of mine that attempt to do that. And uh, some of them I respect, um, I, I respectfully also disagree. There has been no indication and no proof that has ever made me think that the bees can handle this. There's a ton of instance, uh, cases and instances throughout nature of creatures that, did ne that never did find the balance and actually went extinct. Um, thankfully, the honeybees aren't in that kind of peril, but this, it's a very complicated problem and uh, you can't wish it away. Um, do I think that we just need to throw in the towel and not look for some type of resistance or better ways of controlling them? Absolutely. And I hope to maybe be a little um, bit of a part of that, at least helping myself out down the road. But um, I have done a lot of treatment free and uh, it has never once, whether it was purchasing from treatment free stock, those famous gurus that several people listen to, whether it was catching them out of trees and raising stock from those year after year of just breeding from the survivors, small cell foundation, throw a little essential oils in there. If you decide you want to treat a little bit, whatever it is, it, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. And that's exactly what I found with the treatment free. So I might toy around with it more in the future with this test yard that we're going to be trying, but it's definitely not something that I'm counting on going forward because everything that I have done over the last 17 years has shown the opposite to be true is that the mites are extremely hard on our bees and the viruses they carry are devastating. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you in a lot of aspects there. Just going to make sure I'm coming through okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Do you, uh, um, so the comment about treatment free, um, I don't, uh, I don't run any yards in a treatment free sense to kind of select in that in that way. It's something I'm extremely interested in though. Do you uh, touch base with Randy all over at all? Uh, not not really a whole lot actually. Um, I've, I've got an email actually I've sent out to him but I haven't heard anything back so my feelings are hurt just a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm just messing. <laughs> he's an extreme, he's very busy but very. he's he's kind of dabbling with an interesting little project <clears throat> along, along the same lines of treatment free type um, where he's uh, he's uh, taking his apiary and he's shaking uh, uh, his and then he breeds from him and then he does it again he doesn't again and i'm pretty sure he's in, he's incorporating probably a little bit of organic um, treatments like uh, formic or oxalic or thymol and stuff like that periodically just to help with the mite counts but he's taken his entire operation and put it as a test subject and he's involved this kind of type of breeding program where he is seeing efficacy where he's he, he's finding that he's able now to breed queens which can tolerate i won't say they're resistant but they can tolerate uh the varroa mite and i hope i'm not exaggerating uh what's going on there too much but i'm at like i was at a convention i was talking to him and i said randy is it what you know you're showing this efficacy this is very interesting this is something i'd like to do i'm so bloody busy my timelines are too tight i can't do this because uh, if I try to wash everything to find mite counts and then and then follow up with treatments after before I could pull those out to put into my breeding stock, you know, I'd just fall on my face because I'm I'm in such tight timelines. I got to get my hives ready. I got to get them up to, uh, to split off. I got to get them to flow after the flow. I got to get them winter and got to put them back to bed. But I said, I said, what you're doing there interests me. I said, what is it that you're selecting for that is finding that tolerance? for the mites and he said i'm not sure and i he said i don't really care all i care about is finding the tolerance to the mite and whatever is going on you know those that queen that queen right there is handling those mites better than that queen over there he said 
through all his washes, he'll find mite bombs. And these mite bombs, you know, infect the rest of the apiary. And I think we're all familiar with that, especially with neighbors. But, you know, he's got a commercial based business. He's bringing the scientific mythology to it. He's considering husbandry is extremely important. He's in, like, he's, he's, he's not just the, uh, what do you call it, uh, James Bond method or Bond method, yeah, the bond or method. just let them die bond method but he's you know selecting those then dealing with the rest and then breeding from those and just succession after that and he seems to be finding some eff efficacy from it so i think as beekeepers <clears throat> we need to uh maybe i find everybody kind of sits in a camp right we have our tent we sit in the tent we don't want to go out of that tent as a commercial beekeeper, we're looking at the situation. We're like, yeah, we're commercial beekeepers. We're going to treat our bees like, screw those guys. They're treatment-free beekeepers. They don't know what they're talking about. And then same with the treatment-free beekeepers. Like, fuck those commercial guys. You know, they're polluting the environment with all this chemical and all this kind of crap. It's like, no. You know, we have to be able to broaden her, our horizon a little bit. We need to be able to get out of our bloody tent and just explore some ideas like this. Because there's answers out there. We just got to find them. And we can't be all stuck up in this, you know, commercial beekeepers are terrible for it. You know, you, you go on yeah. the commercial beekeeping forum on Facebook and they tear you apart with a new idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is completely natural, right? That's it's, it's what it's got to be because a commercial beekeeper, we can't be pissing around with all these ideas because it's going to send us into bankruptcy. So we find ourselves with a, uh, we have a problem you know, we got a solution and we're going to use that and we're going to make some money on this, at, you know, but at the same time, you look at some of these uh, naturalists that figure they're going to save the world and they're, they're doing all these things and they, you know, which might be beneficial and a uh, like uh, just by the way they think, but in, uh, but in a roundabout way, they're, they're not doing any benefit to anybody or any, it's, anything it's else around them, especially the bees around them. It's just most of the time not practical. And, and the truth seems to usually be in the middle. At, at least that's the way I've, I've always thought about it. And I agree with what you're saying about Randy Oliver. And I, you know, this is one of those things I would love to get on here and, you know, say, man, I was totally wrong about, you know, mite resistant bees and mite immune bees or whatever. Um, every commercial and professional beekeeper wishes that, a lot of them have experimented with that. Um, I am working towards an, ex an experimental yard just for that. And that's one of the things where I feel like um, I, I wanted to devote my time to that as opposed to one, I, there's no way I could run a honey business like you do. We just, if we can produce a hundred pounds on average, we're just freaking out excited. You know, that's, that's amazing down here. And, you know, so spending my time on other things that may be worthwhile, um, I, I feel like the treatment free idea is grand and it is good. I'm thinking probably the truth is somewhere in the middle where maybe we can get some resistance, which would, I mean, anything is helpful at this point. We, we can't just sit on, I was fixing to say sit on our laurels, but that sounds a little weird now, doesn't it? Um, and, uh, <laughs> no, speaking so of, uh, came and speaking of Laurel, I, I was promised that you were going to introduce Laurel to everybody on the uh, <laughs> this time on the microphone <laughs> i am I'm or maybe thinking, not <laughs> I, I, I don't i think i did say that but i'm have i totally forgot about that and just so happens i do have a good excuse um the kids just got back from a barn dance and, and she's really busy um facilitating their needs but oh, <laughs> um yeah I, it just so happens but no i will i promise i will get her on um but it just, it just won't work right now um but along the the train of along the train of thought you're talking about um one thing i do believe just because i don't involve my operation in in any kind of breeding like we do select for traits within our apiary and <clears throat> we do a very good job of it we're just not selecting for mite resistance or mite tolerance we do, however, support programs that do support those type of programs or those type of uh, initiatives. And the one that I comes to mind is the Sask Saskatraz project as developed up in Northern Saskatchewan. Those guys have put a lot of time and money and, and, and um, to develop this, that is a bond method up there. They, they bring these bees in and then they, they take out the survivorship. 
and they breed from that. And it is the right step forward. And I like to support initiatives like that. Um, Ray Oliveira's is uh, tapped into that type of mm -hmm. spirit. Um, Albert is down actually there. Well, this whole COVID thing might be screwing things up, but Albert has a breeding program going down in the Oliveira's uh, outfit. And they're able to, you know, include, you know, you, you start <clears throat> selecting natural traits and then some bad ones come so you want to be able to bring the good ones in to be able to offset those bad ones to be able to pull out those those certain ones that you want to achieve so by uh, collaborating with other breeders we're able to take those real specific traits we're after and bring those good things back into it you know so that Saskatraz project as something I support and I have those bees I buy queens from them every year and I am impressed with the breeding program those guys have going on so I That's my awesome. operation is heavily is heavily influenced by the Saskatraz project so lo, all the bees you're seeing here they're they're not dig directly from the Saskatraz bees but we breed from those when in, in a, after a number of years here so we, you know it's all part of the program right well, so breeding breeding is um so important i know for us and you know some commercial operations are different than others and i think also timing early spring queens out of georgia usually are really poor and i think that's because they get banked so long because there's just a massive amount of packages and there's a lot of conditions um but you know i have found whenever i can find a good supplier of bees and there's a there's a couple people that i trust to get be uh, queens from good queens from and and bringing that into my yard and, and then raising my own has just made huge impacts on what we do around here. And sometimes it's just as simple as, I mean, it's, especially when you're on a small scale, not getting into all the, the data gathering, just which are your colonies that are your easy keepers? Which ones are your champs? Which ones aren't chasing into the house every time yes. you get into them? If that's something that you don't want. So I know some guys that like it, you know, there's some, some weird people out there, but some of them like, man, I like those mean bees. And you know, that's, that's a great characteristic to have. <laughs> and, I, and I'm just thinking, no, I hate headhunters. That's what we call them around here is, is chase you all around the bee yard and whatnot. But it's a, uh, Hey, and I've, I've forgotten to thank everybody who has donated. There's been so many people, Jeff and, and Yasmin with people from Sweden all over the U S and Canada and in so many other places. Um, thanks so much for everything. You know, just truthfully, your, your encouragement is what has kept me doing YouTube videos. I know it, it means a lot to Ian as well. Um, it, it wouldn't, obviously you're not going to keep making videos of what you're doing in Canada. If nobody watches, um, you know, a couple rotten tomatoes thrown at you, you know, there's to keep you humbly. And that's, that's what I, <laughs> I say, especially from those commercial guys, yeah, it, but it's not a rotten tomato. It's more like a, a dump truck of tomatoes usually French. from those guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the interaction. It's a challenge. As long as the, uh, you know, you call it debate or whatever, as long as the interaction, as long as a conversation, it can be heated, as long as it stays on point, and as long as it doesn't get personal. I hate personal attacks. It's, well, you know, sometimes I don't mind it, you know, just jab at a guy a little bit just to poke him and poke him and poke him just to bring out what they really think. But you know, these kind of things are important, just discussion. And we, sometimes when you're stuck in your rut, sometimes it takes a little bit of jabbing or someone kicking your shins and saying, hey, smarten up, or, you know, or look over this way. You know, there's, there's other things that we can be recognizing and just, you know, broaden our perspective a little bit. That's what I'm all about. Just, just you know, trying to see other perspectives. It doesn't mean you got to believe in it. It doesn't mean you have to fall suit. Like I am a card carrying conservative. I am this, I, I've, you know, I, I don't even turn left. I turn right three times to make a left turn. Right. But <laughs> it's, I'm not afraid to see what they have to say. Cause to me, that's important. It's important to hear that other perspective. Cause if I'm going to make my decision or if I'm going to come to a conclusion, I want to make it the best decision to be made so I make fewer mistakes and I want to hear that other perspective and I want to hear the honest opinion and not a bunch of bullshit. I want to hear what 
it's all about. And then I can just decide myself, right? So these conversations are very important. Fluid, fluidness is, yeah. is very, it, it's part of our de democracy. I totally believe in that. <clears throat> and I think we have to foster more of that, just more open-mindedness and more discussion. I think it's really important. A lot of, a lot of it, I think is, uh, you know, how you're raised. I mean, uh, what I see so much in this country, this, this really goes along with beekeeping as well, because we, like you said, we have those camps, those treatment free, the, um, the hardcore treaters. I've been in both of those camps. And uh, I like to say that I'm kind of in the middle now, um, lean more towards treating just because, especially if you're a new beekeeper, I really think that you need to just keep your bees alive, at least for the first year or two, and just learn all the hundreds and or other thousand things that go into bee behavior, what you should expect this time of the year. You don't need to be worrying about your mites wiping them out and trying to breed for resistance and that kind of stuff. And that's, that's my opinion on that. Again, I, I love seeing the stuff that Randy's doing on that front. And I hope that he's more than successful. The Russian breeders down here has some encouraging stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I've tried some of their, their queens out and I'm going to be trying more in the future in a more controlled setting and look, really look forward to that. But it's pushing the envelope on those things. Uh, you're not going to succeed every time. You're, you're totally not going to do it. And as far as having that open dialogue with other people, whether it's political, whether it's beekeeping, so often, and especially because the news is all about bad news. It really is, isn't about the good news. I truly believe that there are, there are so many good people in this country and in Canada as well um, that genuinely, um, if you were hard up, would help you out. I really feel like there's still a majority of those type of people out there, but the news isn't going to show any of the good stuff hardly. Um, it's going to show you the bad. And, and these people, they just cannot have an open discussion. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, and I'm not even sure Ian remembers this, I think I've brought it up to his attention, but we met through an argument on a beekeeping forum. Um, I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> all about. Yeah, B-source. Um, but I don't remember what all we argued about. I remember that's, I remember this, this remember. really big stick in the mud named Ian. Who would name their child Ian anyway? <laughs> what kind of name is that? And uh, <laughs> yeah, he just uh, kept saying all kinds of stuff. And at the time I was probably in my, it was probably about nine, eight years ago, 10. I don't know how many years, it was several years ago. And, uh, you know, through that, um, I don't really like those kind of forums because it really takes the human aspect out of it a lot. And a lot of people don't feel like there's any consequence for saying just whatever the heck they want to. And so I think if you were in person, a lot of the things that you say on those things, would you would not do in person, at least I want, I know some people would, but not me. And uh, anyways, <laughs> there's so, a flip side to that too, though. Like, if when you, you ever notice you whenever you know to you know somebody and that somebody says something that you don't agree with oh yeah but then you don't say anything because you want to be polite you know there's there's that aspect about it too because yeah, i don't want true. to hear i don't want to hear the politeness i want to hear the honest answer i want to hear what you're thinking about because typically i you know someone says something and I say something regardless of what they think, because I could give a damn what they think, but I would just want them to hear my perspective on it. But there's a, sometimes there's politeness or maybe not politeness, but um, intimidation factor maybe mm -hmm. where you're talking to somebody like Randy Oliver, who is like a bloody superstar in the beekeeping business. If you ask yeah. me, I'm a fan of Randy Oliver. Yeah, me too. You're going to conduct yourself a little bit differently around a fellow like that than you would a guy Around like you. me. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I can help it. But no, no seriously. And, and it's weird because um, a lot of times I go to these uh, these conferences or whatever, or I meet people that are on the YouTube and, and they treat me a lot differently than just a couple of years before I had the YouTube. And it, it's really an awkward feeling ac actually because I haven't changed. Um, I, I, I have a YouTube <laughs> channel. I'm still five foot six. I'm shorter than like every guy there. And, uh, you know, so people are constantly looking down on me for one reason or the other. And uh, the jokes just keep flying. But uh, uh, seriously, though, uh, it's you know, just a lot of commercial beekeepers, they don't like talking to uh, hobby types or smaller beekeepers. And, and I just hate that spirit. It just drives me nuts. 
you know, as, as a commercial beekeeper, you get to the point comes in, we're getting into August and I'm tired. We made a lot of honey and these bees are starting to piss me off. And I just start hating bees again. It's like, I don't want anything to do with these bees anymore. I just want to get away from them and just get away. But then I'll talk to a, a hobby type beekeeper who doesn't have that same type of uh, situation. And, you know, they, they're very excited in the energy, and, you know, these bees and all this kind of stuff. And it just helps me, it helps remind me mm -hmm. that, yeah, you know, business is one thing, but you, you got to get through the business, uh, the, the, the art of the craft and the excitement and just the love of the bees. Is, is the reason why I'm here talking to you is because mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with these little buddy insects, right? And the same thing with you, you're making these videos, you're putting this effort because there's something about these bees that just pull out all these little aspects about us. And it's, it, so, you know, you talk to commercial beekeepers, I love it because we talk business, but I just also love talking to those smaller type beekeepers because they they throw different things at you all the time, just different angles of thought and just the, the passion they put towards what they're doing. Like a lot of these guys, go around the United States and around Canada, involve themselves with associations. They have a few hives in the backyard they're doing. They have a full-time job, you know, and they're putting all this time and dedication towards their bees and, and they're forming their life around this aspect around bees. And it's just really fascinating because for me, uh, the beekeep, the bees is me, like everything about me, everything I do is the bees other than the rest of the farm that we manage here. But you know, I'm involved with bees as, as every part of me all the time, where a lot of people it's not, it's like they professional career somewhere else. And they focus this little world around bees. I just find that absolutely fascinating. And it kind of brings me back to a little part that got me into the beekeeping business <clears throat> was that, was that, was that simple, um, honest ambition, that innocence. And it got me into the bees, the bees took a hold of me. And then I just took it from there into something, uh, into career. But, uh, yeah, very, Anyways, very that's words. Yep. A very, you know, that's, uh, you can, you can totally turn it into a, a monster sometimes as well. I'm, I'm sure, you know, running as many hives as you have, you've gotten that, that feeling before where it's just like, <laughs> I, like you said, I, I'm just so tired and done with bees, but you know, I, we've done that here before, especially back last year when I was working you know, about 50 hours a week um, at another job and then trying to build the business up and, and just, just different things like that. And the YouTube channel, it was just so much. And it, you know, the, the hours that we were working were stupid, but it, again, it's a testament to how much we love honeybees. I mean, who, who's willing to work 90 and sometimes a hundred hours on a week to, you know, do something like get stung by bugs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my, and, and thankfully, <laughs> this, this whole, I was just going to comment, you men mentioned putting time into YouTube. This whole YouTube project is holy man. It's, it's a lot of fun. Like I, I do these uh, YouTube videos for a lot of reasons other than just a little bit of kickback YouTube gives me and, you know, just the, the attention I get. But, uh, this YouTube thing can be completely consuming. Like, holy crap. Yeah. You start this whole little YouTube business and then you're making a little bit of money and the, you, you form this little bit of following, you know, people are watching your videos. And if you don't put a video up every other day, they're starting to email you, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Because kind of thing. And YouTube's always promoting you to put more yeah. content up there and all this kind of stuff. And it's like, it up fuck off already you know it's just like i've made a promise to myself that this youtube project is something that i'm doing um and i find it a lot of fun really interesting but it isn't what i do you know the farm is what i do family is what i do all these other things and this youtube thing is kind of my hobby so i always make sure that whenever it seems like youtube's coming in is this encroaching and just kind of controlling maybe a little bit too much I'll just pull back a little bit and make sure I focus on the priorities of the day and such. Usually about this time of year, when I get overwhelmed with work and, and money and stress and all this kind of, all these things is going on in the farm, I find that I got to cut something out. And usually this time of year, I start pulling back on the videos a little bit. Yeah. It's not like I put a lot of time into them. Cause I'm just like, I hold a camera up. I say something, I take some still shots of, or some active 
work shots and I kind of edit it five minutes while my wife's watching these crappy uh, drama movie or shows on TV and it's just uploaded online. So I don't put a lot of production value into my videos, but uh, it still takes time, it takes time and takes, you know, distracts your attention. And so I don't know, I, it, I probably, I've watched you and your videos and kind of listen to what you've been saying over the last little while. And I sense the same thing with you too. You, you do recognize that, that, uh, you know, you got to focus on priorities aspect of your life and you got to make sure that you, you hold the, uh, the hobby type activities like this, where it's really neat, really fascinating. And it's, it's super cool, but you, you, it has to go to the side because you got more important priorities to look after. Well, Kids, kids for one, and you know, family and <laughs> kids. Yeah, uh, you know that's <laughs> no doubt. I, my, I tell you, my daughter Kathleen, um, I, I, I would give a hundred dollars, uh, if I could have had uh, yesterday. We were out feeding a couple yards of bees, and the kids went with us. And uh, Kathleen's eight years old, and she's just, you know, just the eight-year-old innocence, and uh, she's very sweet. We have two different types of personalities with the kids. Kathleen's the type that is going to grow up without proper care to be an adult that is too caring, too giving of herself. She's the type of person that gets taken advantage of if she's not taught by her dad and mom that she needs yeah. to put her foot down because she just loves people so much. Um, Jimmy's the type that's half her age and already taken advantage of that caring personality. <laughs> So we're, ha we're having to work on things here a little bit, but Kathleen was, um, I just, I pretend like I had a microphone in my hand. I said, you know, Kathleen, please tell us more about the bees and what about Queens and stuff. And you know, she was just laying it on me and it was just great stuff. And I didn't have it, but I, I could very well be out of a job before too long. She, of course, right now they both love the bees quite a bit, but um, I, I would love it if one of them or both of them, decided that they uh, wanted to make that part of the family business but uh, family is there's not a close second um, when it comes to things going on around here um, you know, they're only little for a short period I can't believe they're already the age that they are Jimmy's turning five this coming week so he's turning the quite the big boy I offered to um, practice on the birthday spankings and the pinch to grow an inch um, and he <laughs> refused actually uh but uh anyways um i know that you've got to be running pretty soon uh, maybe if we could go out with a, a question really quick and uh, yeah maybe just uh, just wanted to comment one thing before you go on to the next question just mention family and you know there's a lot of guys probably watching our videos or whatever maybe even watching this and they're trying to build their business and if i was good to give any point of advice is basically on that family point and I learned the hard way, but you got to make sure, especially guys building a business, we're entrepreneurs and we got the work spirit and we're workaholics, right? And we got to make sure that when we're building this business, that we can identify the point of time or the points of time within the year where we can get away from the business and spend time with the family. There's no such thing as a work family business balance i don't believe in that there's no such thing as that but there but you have to put the effort towards your family anytime you can a guy like me is a workaholic starts making excuses to work when he's not busy right and then you end, you end up just working and working and working and sometimes working for no reason whatsoever and your family gets forgotten and we're doing this whole thing for the family i mean that's why we do this so we got to make sure that we focus on the business. Business has got to take priority when it, when we're busy because that's that's basically our livelihoods. So we got to look after that. But when we don't have to look after that, we got to make sure that we step back, and we got to make sure that we look after our family too because that's why we do it. So, anyways, <clears throat> well, that's just I mean, a little bit. Well, I appreciate that, and you know, getting that healthy balance is, is really difficult. And there's times where you just got to push and there's just, there's hard, it, it helps when you have an understanding wife, like I do. Um, she's especially Damn since right, she's out yeah. there uh, helping me. Um, a lot of women just could not handle, could not handle this. There were several girls I was interested in as a uh, <laughs> high school age and watch out. You're going to get a book thrown at you. <laughs> well, 
I'm getting around to the compliment here. As long as I word this the right way. You're going to get slapped here. Danger, danger. <laughs> you know, no, nobody cares if a woman smacks a man, you know. So, and, and, I'm, and I'm white. Oh, danger. Yeah. So anyways, um, uh, and anyways, so, you know, Laurel's able to put up with so much in these, these other gals, you know, at the time, um, they were fairly pretty, you know, nothing like Laurel is, of course. So I'm see what I'm doing here. And um, <laughs> you're, you're just treading in <laughs> this thin ice, buddy. You, you, you know, keep it going. <laughs> so anyways, um, you know, ultimately Laurel was the, the, was the right choice. She was just some, some people just aren't suited for this lifestyle. And it is very, very, very hard on, um, on, a, on the whole family at, at points of the year where you, you just have to give, the business everything but you've got to find those moments where you you can get that family time and I, I find a lot of times in the summer I saw that video of you all um, at the lake up there it was probably still really frigid compared to what it is down here in our lakes but um, you know finding that family time is, is so valuable and and when we haven't in the past taken that time how much that negatively in, impacts the business because that, that stress just builds up and then we just can't hardly seem to even put in a full work day because we're just so, so stressed out. And sometimes just getting away for a little bit is all that it takes and spending that quality time together. And when you come back, you're ready to go at it again with that new um, vigor. And uh, that's yeah. just, I actually, if I find, I find with my work staff, I kind of related to myself too. <clears throat> I, I work my guys they come to eight o'clock, they leave at five. Sometimes we work till seven that day. But I find when I work my work staff, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then we're busy. So I work them on Saturday. And then sometimes, you know, the dreaded Sunday. And then they start Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, that next week is almost a write-off for those guys because I've overworked them. You know, they're not used to my pace of work style. So I find it's more productive to work my guys through the week and give them the weekend off because then they come back on Monday and, you know, typically they're fresh or ready to put the next week. Cause if I don't get that time off, they're working two weeks straight. And then for them, and that's an eternity. Right. And I look, I kind of relate that back to myself in a lot of ways is like, if I don't find time to give myself a break sometime through the year just to get away like I try to get away for about a week to the lake with the family and maybe odds and ends here and there if I don't find that time then I just kind of self-destruct later down the line like you know you got to give yourself that personal time you got to get away from the bloody farm the work's going to be there when you you know you show up the next day so you just got to make sure to be able to look after yourself sometimes too then that's one of the hardest things that is about the farm is the work's always there like it's never going away and you have those commitments and you get a multi enterprise farm like ours, there is a busy time throughout the entire year. You can't get away from it. So you got to be able to put together the rules and the dynamics that allow you to get away and allow, you know, when it is busy to make sure that it's getting done or just put a plan in place to be able to identify those busy times and then identify those non busy times and utilize those non-busy times to get away yeah. and in the long run you you, you make more money yeah. and you're well, healthier and everybody else is healthier around you going along with that just real quick the uh when you have maybe a full-time job like i did you know a lot of us aren't starting out you know you didn't start out at where you're at right now it takes so many years to build up and trial and error and also you have the farm to manage as well so there's just a lot of factors going in there but you know for those of you who are looking at taking it to a large sideline or even full time down the road some of you looking for that in retirement some people kind of doing what i'm doing maybe even some doing as as large as going to the almonds or something like ian balancing that it is so important but i would just say this is that when i first started there's always the tendency to well I've learned so much over this year, even though I've got like 50 hives right now, I can handle 150. All right, let's go to 200. Let's buy these bees and bring them in and let's do that. And I really, I, 
I feel like I'm t- like on my own, my dad sometime. If I went back in time and talked to myself 15 years ago, I would be like my dad coming back and talking to me and just saying, Hey, if you can't keep 20 hives healthy and make a profit off of 20 hives, you have no business doing a hundred. You have no business doing 200 for sure. And it, 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 I know it's kind of boring and it's not exciting and adventurous. Like we all like to do our beekeeping, but, but it is a sound business, a sound business plan that if you can't do it s- slow, you can't do it fast. And when I was playing mandolin years ago, the, the guy that taught me is like, Hey, if you can't play this song slow, you have no business playing it fast. And that, that was a very <laughs> true statement. And, uh, and with bees, it's the same way. So I think a lot of us though, we, we jump in too quick. I had a guy that asked me about purchasing yeah. a commercial operation completely out and didn't even have the experience of running a hundred yeah. hives yet, which is just, especially with bees as dynamic as they are. Hey, if you do it right, you could make a, a good yeah bit maybe in the first year but the problem is if you don't you could lose everything they're just that dynamic yeah and uh so it's just one of those things where keep it small get it right and then build off of that foundation because you'll lose your shirt i've done it before i think most professionals in some form or fashion have done that we our ambition sometimes gets the better of us and we end up stressing our financial ourselves financially we stress ourselves with our family it just it all ties in together and then sometimes uh well typically the the tortoise you know wins the race because uh you know he just slow and steady you know all that kind of stuff but uh, getting to that last question yeah there's there's a lot of truth that you you made the comment i i'll give you one more question because my brother is starting to bug me about i gotta go to the wet bin to get some corn dried but you you said talking to yourself 50 years ago and that's you know when i make my videos got the camera up here i'm always talking to somebody and i don't know if when you're making your videos if you talk you, you think to your, yourself i'm talking to somebody i'm talking to you know eddie in missouri or i'm talking to ian in canada or somebody not sure if you do that but when i make these videos i'm talking to myself 15 years ago it's like hey yeah. buddy don't make that mistake. You know, this is what I'm seeing, you know, 15 years ago, I'm looking for this perspective on beekeeping. And I was hungry to, you know, what's a commercial beekeeper doing? What's a commercial beekeeper thinking? Like what is going on? Like there's all these things happening right now. Like, you know, give me some insight. So that that's basically what I'm doing to these videos is just off the cuff, looking in the camera, just behind the scenes in the trenches kind of deal. So yeah, it kind of I- gets people who find it useful. That, that's exactly how I approach my videos is talking to my younger stupid self, um, just ignorant self that really thought that he had it figured out just because I read every book I could get my hands on <laughs> doesn't mean I could translate it out into the field. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully between your videos and maybe a couple that I do, and you know, so there's some other good producers out there as well that we can help save some folks a, a lot of money and time ultimately we all love bees and I would, you know, I know that you would like to see people have success with them. And I, I do too. Um, and that's what kind of leads me to this last question. I, I apologize. I, I know a lot of you have had a lot of questions and I haven't even probably been able to look at a fraction of them. And several of you have sent donations and just so many different things. You all are the best. Um, I think I, down the road, we'll do this again and maybe just have it answers and questions the whole time. If Ian would be open to doing something like that. Um, I, I know people would love that. This has been more of a little bit of an interview, but I have totally enjoyed it. And I appreciate your time Ian, and your videos very much. Um, my last question is, is basically what is something new that you are looking forward to in your operation? Something that's going to either bring better nutrition to the bees, a better efficiency to your operation. Maybe a, you've already talked a little bit about new strain of genetics, but what's something in those categories, what's something that can make what you're already doing better that you feel like maybe isn't too far down the road? Oh boy, that is a good question. Um, <clears throat> I don't know how to answer that. You know, you could look, <clears throat> I could look on the angle of you know, the exciting type of equipment or building facility or maybe, you know, if I'm lucky enough, maybe my son or daughter or nephew or niece or whatever wants to get into bees and we can, you know, take the operation into the next step into something bigger maybe or 
I don't know. Um, one thing that I have a lot of interest in right now, and I, I dedicate a lot of thought towards it, and uh, it's towards uh, nutrition. I don't think that's any surprise to anybody. I, I spend a lot of attention towards nutrition. And there's, <clears throat> I have, I put a lot of attention towards supplements and all this, because I believe just like the animals we feed in our farm, the cattle, we, we provide supplements and all this jazz. I believe that the bees would benefit from some of that too. But I'm thinking more so they're, they, they're, they benefit from the supplements just because they're lacking what is naturally available for them in the environment. And, you know, this might lead down to a bit of a rabbit hole, but it's, um, the things are changing on us right now. I've only been in this business for 20, 22 years or whatever. So I haven't seen a, a big time frame of, of what's naturally available for the bees that's going on. You know, you hear all these uh, stories about the good old days, but <clears throat> agriculture is changing with all the technologies that are coming in with plant breeding and with uh, chemicals and with just different land management practices and i'm not going to knock any of that at all i think anybody that pays attention to me knows that i'm a champion of agriculture and we're using all these uh, technologies but to progress forward and to feed the bloody world is what we're doing we're utilizing the land unlike any other time before and we're growing crops which is just absolutely mind-blowing i mean we just grew a sunflower crop that's 3,100 3, pounds an acre it's just brilliant you know clean fields we're, we're able to access properties now uh, using, you know, land management techniques that, that we weren't able to farm other times before. But all these things are coming together and they're changing the landscape and they're, they're, they're stripping that natural aspect of the landscape away from it. And that natural aspect is something that the bees need. The bees need it in the f form of pollen. We can substitute sugars with simple sugar but the bees need pollen we can try to feed these bee supplements all we want but they're not going to do a damn thing unless they have that even just a trickle of that natural pollen coming in because there's that factor that we haven't figured out yet the natural spirit that spirit of the environment around them and everything that happens around these bees is influencing within these colonies <clears throat> and as as the environment changes so are our hives. They're becoming malnourished. They're becoming less thrifty. I mean, we talk about uh, this bee plate, save the bee plate or whatever. It's, you know, it's not one thing. It's everything that's happening around us right now that's affecting our bees. So I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in balance. And I truly feel that as we progress forward with agriculture, I truly feel that people give a damn to be able to recognize that we're falling into a bit of an imbalance developments taking over we need to you know ratchet that back a little bit and we need to build to re-establish natural places in the in in the environment or we need to manipulate the environment to be able to bring those natural aspects back because it's extremely important and i find it very exciting maybe this maybe this might lead into answering the question but i find it very exciting that we as beekeepers might be that that medium that connects the that de, the world of development <clears throat> that world of development to the world of uh, environmentalists right two polar opposites they are not going to talk to each other but as a beekeeper we we have our toes in the development world because we 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 take the bounty of this mass of crops of agriculture and these pollination contracts and such but at the same time we can't exist we can't maintain our hives without uh, that natural aspect of the environment. So we connect the two. And I, I think that, you know, we might be the bridge. I think beekeepers play an important role to be able to maybe take a step forward. We got to catch up to agriculture, one thing, but at the same time, we need to pull back all this development to be able to ensure that we preserve the natural aspect of the world around us. Because it's very important. It's important to absolutely everybody on the planet. I mean, you go to the lake, mm -hmm. you go fishing, you want to go out to the wilderness, right? You're going for that natural aspect. But, you know, you come back to your job and you're, you're, you're kicking the grind, you know, you're, you're, you know, making some cash. So we have to be able to find that balance. And I think we can achieve that if we just 
you know, broader perspective a little bit, listen to what's being said, listen to what is needed, and then just try to Dang it, I lost him. He's still on, but froze out. Yeah, uh, like the way we farm, it's we. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. yeah, we're good okay. now. Uh, the way we farm our land, we adopt all the technologies. We have the uh, GMOs. We have we we drain our land. We have all the crop breeding. We have the big equipment. We have the square fields is where we ever can have square fields. We, you know, we are, we're, we are agriculture. <clears throat> um, but at the same time, we're managing our lands in a way where we're protecting the, the natural waterways, the riparian areas, the sloughs, you know, we have sloughs around open water in some places, you know, where we don't have that, we promote, uh, that natural pollen by growing pollinator strips is something I've just started incorporating into the farm. They grow diversity of flowers and have them start to bloom during times when there's dearth, where you know where agriculture maybe has taken away that diversity, add it around the edges. So that way I'm not interfering with my brother with everything he's doing in his field. You know, I can add a little bit of that around the edges. I'm yeah. still getting in his way, but I'm just, you know. I'm over here and he can maybe tolerate that a little bit. Then he realizes that it's a benefit to his farm because those bees, those healthy bees just gave him a bumper crop of sunflowers, right? Mm -hmm. And that canola, we're pollinating that canola and all those natural living insects doesn't even have to be pollinators, but that natural aspect of the world, which helps counteract some of the negative parts of mother nature, they exist and they're just sitting there waiting to pounce on that problem. And farmers recognize that. And I'm noticing more farmers around the countryside, more big farmers, like 10,000 acre farmers, 50,000 acre farmers, 2,000 acre farmers, they're all starting to recognize that over manipulation of the land is ultimately costing them more money because they're having to spend more money on controlling all those issues around them where, where mother nature maybe could have taken care of them otherwise. So that's, that's, that's that is a, a little bit of a rant. Yeah, well, I mean, it wasn't a rant. It was a it was very detailed question and more than I even hoped to get. Um, <laughs> but I mean, it, it was exactly what I wanted. It's truly we, we have got to stop. Um, and this is where this is the exact subject I think that we argued on was something in, in relation to this. And, uh, you know, I, I can't be the extreme guy who's wanting to tell every farmer, you've got to change because there are some issues without without being able to fix those issues and also be able to maintain your livelihood that's the problem is we've got these extreme groups that want all this change and yet usually they're the least qualified to be able to you not only bring about the change but also be able to implement what is even going on right now and understanding what the impacts of if that change was allowed to happen would cause i mean if all of a sudden you said overnight all right we are going to stop, you know, you know, GMOs right out the gate. What were the impacts are going to be immediately to the economy, to families and all that kind of stuff. I am not a fan of uh, chemicals as, as general. The chemicals is really a loose word because everything is pretty much a chemical, but I'm all about finding the cleanest ways to keep our waters clean. But the more and more I talk to people like you, the more I realize, you know, farmers, if anybody are, are the ones that are more concerned about the condition of the land, uh, you know, that truly, I mean, it impacts them more than anyone. You all really don't want to see it float downstream your topsoil. You know, that's why folks are drilling crops now instead of using plows so much. I mean, you, you know, back in, you know, early 1900s, people were plowing everything and out west, and it was just a terrible idea for the little rain they got, a dust bowl, lost so much topsoil, sent it all the way out to the east. That's why we actually had a little bit of dirt to grow crops in over here because we didn't have ro just rocks anymore. And, um, you know, just but yeah. basically and just I, 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 together. I, I agree. <clears throat> and I will say to our argument we had a number of years ago, like you're right on point also, big problems. Like we do have big problems, but these problems have been in the works for the last 80 years. 
and they're not going to stop tomorrow. And I think my argument was, okay, this is the situation. This is, this is what, okay, what we want changed. Give me a solution. And if there's no solution right now, then we can't change, right? But I think that as we carry on and if, as we develop new technologies, as, as if and as society is, you know, kind of pushing us saying, this is what we want, then the technology is going to catch up. We're going to be able to evolve to a system that's more satisfactory. You know, it takes money and it takes yeah. effort. Well, it Effort's takes a people. tough one. I mean, society, they, I mean, they can bitch about uh, whatever they want on, on Facebook. Uh, but what's the effort behind that, right? If they don't, don't want to support GMOs, then quit buying the bloody GMOs from other places in the world for dirt cheap, right? If they want to uh, eat a wholesome food without chemicals on it, then pay for it. And then we'll produce that for you. We'll produce that for you all day long. But they're going to the supermarket and they're buying food that's fruit produced cheap and it's very high quality, but it's used with uh, modern day chemical farming, right? Ultimately, and I have no problem with that. Ultimately, you vote every day what you want with your money, uh, whatever you buy, what you watch on YouTube, um, news, all that stuff. Whatever you, whatever you do basically votes for you on your preferences. Um, and that's I totally agree with that. And I, I do think that there are a lot of people pushing towards it. The problem is that the biggest hurdle we have in beekeeping and in, in agriculture, I think, is we have, the, again, the camps that are too busy shouting so loud that they, they can't get to that middle um, area where they can actually have meaningful conversation that actually brings about change. And there are people though, that are in the middle, but you know, they're not, they're not the ones that are getting Facebook time. They're not the people that are getting interviewed because it's not sexy to talk about people actually rolling up their sleeves and working together and doing work. And we could talk about this literally 10 hours because um, it, it's so interesting talking to somebody <laughs> who's doing this and also to talk up more about bees. Cause uh, there's, you just can't talk about bees enough, but I, I, your brother's going to kill you if I. Uh, yeah, I really, he's my, I got to go because I got to unload the wet into the wet bin. We're combining corn, but I want to mention one thing before I run here. Uh, the videos that you're doing um, are really good. Very well done. You, uh, I watch pretty much all of them whenever I get a chance. Uh, you, you bring, uh -oh. you're very well spoken. But also Laurel on the video camera, she does a great job capturing the moment. Like whenever I'm watching a video, I'm listening to the guy yap, like you're yapping about the bees and all that kind of stuff. But it's also looking at the perspective of the camera. And, you know, half the time I'm, I'm not looking at you, I'm looking at all the stuff behind, or I'm looking at all those certain aspects of whatever theme that you're talking about. And your camera person there is doing a really good job that being able to capture that. I've mm -hmm. tried yeah. taking my camera and handing it off to somebody as I talk, but it never works out very well because they're always showing the wrong thing at, a, at the wrong time all the time. And it just drives it's... me batty. But uh, just, I know Laurel's there, but just pass on the good word yeah. that she's doing a good job on the camera and to keep up the good work. <laughs> I, I appreciate that very much. I know she does. Um, she just came in here a little while ago and she's blushing. So um, she blushes pretty easily. <laughs> um, having to put up with me and my shenanigans, she, her cheeks are pretty red <laughs> constantly, but no, it, it is, it is a skill. I mean, it, she has gotten so, um, when she started out, she did a good job, but she just, she's constantly perfecting it. Um, it helps that she knows what I'm talking about so she can go right to it. She's very intuitive to what I'm doing and uh, she has a desire to get better at it, which is just a wonderful characteristic. Laurel, if I had anybody, let's, let's say we weren't married, but I knew her characteristics there. I have not met anybody I would rather have on my side, man or woman, because she, uh, she just is tough and she's, and she's smart. Um, you know, all these activists out there saying that, you know, you know, some white guy like me is, um, you know, just sexist pig and all that kind of stuff. I, I worship the, the ground my wife walks on because there wouldn't be no YouTube channel. There'd be no business. There would be none of this stuff without Laurel. She's very quiet, but she is very, very crucial. And um, I'm sure she appreciates you saying that. But, Ian, I'll let you get to it. I look forward to seeing your next video. Yeah. 
and uh, our internet connection is cutting out here anyway so it might be a good time to step out yeah. but i appreciate you inviting me onto your channel here i usually watch it i don't watch all your chats that you do like this but i usually tune in every once in a while when i get a chance i find it very enjoying and i think a lot of beekeepers do so keep up the good work and uh, we'll we'll keep in touch all right thanks ian you take care All right, so I'm still alive, right? All right, so everyone, I am, for those of you who are still on, um, thank you so much for watching this special interview with Ian. It was just a lot of time of us getting to talk. Actually, until a couple of days ago, I'd never talked to Ian as far as on the phone or in live or in person or anything like that. It, we, we chat periodically, maybe through whether it's messages on YouTube or Facebook messenger, but you know, he's pretty busy often and I don't want to annoy him. And, you know, he doesn't message me a whole lot and, you know, we're guys. Um, you know, we just, uh, you know, Hey, what's going on? Ah, uh, not much working bees sweating a lot. What's going on with you? I work in bees, freezing my butt off. You know, there's a little, that's pretty much the only difference, but, but seriously, um, you know, he's been, a a really good friend of ours um, since the beginning of this channel and very supportive. And um, it was really nice having him on. Uh, let's see, Laura, can you bring up the chat window and thanks to everyone who donated will be. Um, let's see, I'm sharing actually more in an upcoming live chat on where those donations are going. There is so many things coming up. I, I really have laid out a plan. I'd like to read out to you in the future about the experimental yard because we're not just going to be testing insulated hives versus traditional wooden hives we'll also be testing in the wooden hive department different odd types of protection for that wood linseed oil also there's an eco wood treatment out there there's a couple other natural products we're not going to be wax dipping those hives and we're not going to be doing traditional painting and stuff we are going to be I'm trying out some new things because there's a lot of you know folks out there that say, hey, I just do this to my hive or I do this or I, I tried this product and it worked pretty good, but it's really hard to know how well it does. And especially in an area like mine, we get tons of rain, tons of rot here. What'll work good in a place that only gets 12 inches of rain a year might fall apart in three or four years here in Tennessee just because it can't handle it. Wow, 405 people still on? That's what someone just said, or, or close to it. That is crazy. Um, I tell you, one of the things I love most about Ian Stepler is the fact that he is, it's just like going down the road and talking to some of the farm country boys around here. You know, he might throw in a A or something Canadian every now and then. Um, you know, I've actually only heard him say that once, and I was so excited to hear it because I've got all of these um, totally messed up I mean, visions of what Canadians are supposed to sound like from watching too many cartoons as a kid. The old classic ones that, you know, no one watches anymore um, because they're not politically correct. Um, but he is, he's just, he's real. And also he can laugh. Um, I think that's one of the most, and he can smile. That's one, one of the most attractive characteristics about anybody that you're going to be interviewing or just being around is that they can laugh at themselves. They can laugh at you being an idiot, um, which I am really proficient at. Let me tell you, Laurel knows all about that. Um, you guys are way too awesome. I'm listening to a bunch of bee nerds um, talk about bees <laughs> just for two hours. Um, we, yeah, just one second, but we, yeah, he, he, he kind of does, Christopher, um, but we definitely, I can't even remember what I was going to say. The train has derailed. Um, there has been several of you that I've missed that have donated. I've talked to Ian, um, and it looks, I, I know he's going to be really busy coming up, but we're going to try to have him on just as a question and answers q and I, I got to most of the questions that people sent to me on either a, a video um, prior to this one or via my Gmail, my uh, email address. But um, there's still a couple that I missed and I'm sorry if I did. Um, it just, I actually didn't expect Ian to open up and talk that long because he mentioned that he's not much of a talker, but once he gets, he gets going, um, he's got a lot to say and it was all really good. I enjoyed 
all of it. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to Justin, um, Dave Lee, uh, Yasmin, um, the Bee at Faithman Apiaries, uh, Freeland Apiaries, um, and Larry Lee's Bees, and uh, Jeff Upton, and uh, Stan Butt, um, Yasmin again, Nature Sweet Bees, and C-A-W-W-T. I would, um, yeah, and I said Justin um, Soros, and you know, thank you, you all so much. Um, just like the things that Ian was talking about, about pushing the envelope when it comes to nutrition, a lot of these things, nature isn't always easy on our bees. We need more understanding about what's going on in our hives. It's, it's an exciting time. I, at least I feel like there is uh, a lot of exciting things going on. Back when I started 17 years ago, or even um, 10 years ago, the access to a lot of this information, like he shared um, that scientist up there in Manitoba's information, you know, if it wasn't for the YouTube channel, I may have never got my hands on that, or it might have been 20 years from now. Um, there's so many different ways of slicing the orange. And over in Europe, some of the folks that are um, subscribers of mine, I think his as well, are talking about how they're using um, acid, citric acid, and, and different things to help prevent fermentation of the syrup. And they say their studies over there are really beneficial for the overwintering colonies still. And they very well may be. But the thing of it is we need this open you know, dialogue going on between not only people the same country, but other countries and figuring these things out. Because right now, there's thousands of questions that need to be answered. And, you know, there's just so much work that needs to be put into getting to the truth of it or the truths. With some of these things, there are multiple truths. And um, you could just be like, you know, more like Ian and I, where we just feed basically straight syrup. You know, Bob Benny down there, um, he puts a little bit of bleach in his. You know, I have done that before in emergency situations. I really don't like doing it. But um, if I've got 50 gallons of syrup, which costs a lot of money, and I, I for whatever reason, can't get it out, pump broke down, um, whatever the reason, maybe can't get into the bee yards, all the rain, you know, I'll put some bleach in it and, and save it. Um, but I don't like doing that. And that's just, that's my personal opinion. Um, I really, really appreciate Ian's ability to not be one of those guys that just really focuses on where he's at, what he's doing now, and doesn't push towards the future. He, he, I think he's got a lot of foresight. And it's funny because I, that we met through an argument, a pretty, um, pretty good disagreement. And I never thought in my wildest dreams that we'd end up doing something like this several years later. Of course, at that time, I don't think he had a YouTube channel, and I definitely was not thinking of having one. Um, but here we are. And uh, I, I think that maybe that says as much about his personality as anything is that he is willing to, even though had a heated argument with somebody, willing to still continue a, a conversation with that person. And I think a lot of people who, even though um, you may disagree on something, still are able to interact with one another. There's also several people that have donated on um, PayPal, and we really appreciate you as well. Um, I, yeah, thanks, Roy's boys. Um, I, I thought Ian did a fantastic job. Ian, Ian told me, um, coming into this, he, he didn't think that he was a, a really good speaker and very good at it. And and maybe maybe he's not the world's greatest speaker, but I think he does a really good job. And he's got half a dozen at least Zoom chats coming up. And I think he's going to do a, a great job. It's definitely a good service to beekeeping. And uh, so um, I'm going to stay on here just a little bit longer and answer any questions that anyone has. If anyone's got any questions, um, drop them start dropping them. Even if you asked them, uh, you know, 15 questions ago, I, I have not really seen a whole lot. And I've got, I'm using a, a little different style of computer and I'm not very proficient at this one. Ah, so someone said, if you mute whoever is not talking, it might help with the bandwidth. Ian says they have poor internet up there. And I think that is a, in large part due to that because the other day when it was just the two of us, we were still having issues, um, and but he says there's several people on it. Likely, um, it was something to do with that. But um, oh, is that an hour? How do I get back down? I don't know what I've done. Laurel's helping me. Okay, so how do I use this? I really hate computers. 
All right, Greensbees, thank you very much. Excellent interview, Cam. And quick question, Apame Hive, should I get the frames or use wood frames? They work. Um, there are one or two maybe advantages to them. The plastic, they don't propolize down near as hard. The disadvantage with plastic is that it slides. I also think that um, in cold weather, if you drop it, especially if it's got some weight in it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to crack for sure. Another advantage is if you're using wax foundation, um, if you haven't watched the video that I did on how to put wax foundation in it, it is super easy. It's, it's crazy easy compared to using a wooden frame. You can just smash it right down on in there. It's really fast. So that's an advantage with it. Um, one of the other advantages is that you don't have to, I guess, worry about um, rot and all that kind of stuff. But honestly, I don't like the sliding. Um, I prefer wood. They're totally compatible with wood, and that's just what I like. But there's some guys out there that like uh, the plastic frames. But um, either way, I think you're good to go. Your bees are going to do well either way. Yes, yes, that was that one. Let's see. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally not going for a beekeeping UN. Um, I totally – this is one of the things that I struggle with. Um, most about um, with you know, the whole everyone collaborating and be becoming one because this whole idea of United Nations or everything should be integrated. The problem with that is the fact that we lose so much out of that. The diversity is what makes us learn uh, new things. It, it was what challenges us. It's what made America great is the fact that we had people from so many different cultures and countries with totally different experiences, whether it was beekeeping or otherwise, sharing those and collaborating those things. And, and that's one of the things that I, I struggle with with the whole social media is the fact that we can lose our culture because of that. We need people in the South acting like people from the South. It uh, doesn't mean they can't learn things from people from the North or even out of country. Um, but we definitely want to maintain um, that diversity for sure. And um, not just in beekeeping, but I think as cultures, I, I would hate to see a lot of these um, practices that, you know, Germans do or um, just any culture, you know, just, it, it's so cool to me. I, I find it all fascinating. and wish I had a longer life to live, to experience it. Um, so in the tub feeders, have you tried pool noodles cut to fit and use pieces to space them? I have not. And honestly, I have not opened um, fed bees hardly at all, but I did some this year using Ian's method. And basically all I did is take some boards just like Ian does. You've got your totes and you just have you know, board slats running in there with you know little gaps in between. And I take straw just kind of like Ian does. You can use hay or, or some other things, but I, I like straw because it's more uniform and just stick it down in there. And I, I talked um, to Ian about it a little bit and it did really well. There is some bee loss with it, not very much. And what you have to consider, especially when you're doing it late in the fall, there's, there's always some bee loss when bees are foraging, whether it's natural or not. You know, if they forage milkweed flowers, milkweed flowers actually can kill quite a few bees. Their legs get caught down in the flowers and they die of exposure um, over time or eaten by something. So, you know, be, bees are expendable to the colony. They, they have to be. That's why they make so many of them. Obviously, we don't want to kill any that we don't have to, but there are bees dying every second. And especially if they're constantly hitting the feeders, that's where all the older bees are going. And eventually they get so weak, they're going to die in a place where it's, they're going to struggle the most. So it might not necessarily be your feeder. If you got 50 or hundred dead bees in there, but if you get it to where you have, like he said, plenty of space for them to open feed. So they're not fighting for these little seams and pushing each other down and you have um, straw in there, you know, I'll, I'll see if I can sh show you all kind of what I did, but I don't like doing it a lot because you can feed other people's bees. You're losing money. You could potentially bring in maybe even disease problems with it. And especially if, uh, if you're doing it during a time when people still have honey supers on, I, I don't like that at all. Um, you know, doing it, um, I'm, I'm doing it at the end of the season and, uh, you know, nobody's harvesting honey this time of the year in Tennessee. And I, I like to talk to the beekeepers around here about what I'm doing as well and, and seeing what their feelings on it are. It's always good to 
check that. So yeah, I really am looking to the eco wood treatment. There's a, another treatment that's kind of like that and you dip, dip it in as well. And just seeing how long they hold up, they might be awesome. There's also a couple other interesting products that help um, wood be preserved that are more natural, but no one's really done any tests on them. So some of these tests for the experimental yard are actually going to be pretty long lived and we'll see how they, you know, the wood holds up three or four years later. You know, and uh, Laurel was just reminding me to remind you that, you know, that's where all this money is going. You know, we're, um, the test yard, I'm going to have it all laid out. I, right now, I don't have all the information in front of me, but basically the expenses of it, what the goals are. I'm going to have that, you know, to where you all can see it because when it keeps me accountable. And then on top of that, um, I want to meet these goals. They're, they're important to me. These are things that I've wanted some of these to do for years. I'm a curious guy and and I, I want to perfect my business. And the only way to do that is to experiment. So Stan Butt Jr. said, Bob, don't put no bleach. Okay. Um, you know, I, I really think that it, it messes with the guts myself. Um, I, I'm seeing the wrong thing. Uh, da, 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 da. So some people say pool noodles work really well. I have no idea. Someone was asking about requeening, how often did I do that? I'm tinkering with that a lot, and I really don't like getting rid of a queen that's still really awesome prematurely. However, on the colonies that I requeened this year, which was a pretty large percentage, it wasn't like 50%, but it was still probably between 30 and 40%. Those are some of my best-looking colonies. Whenever you're requeening, it's a prime opportunity to kill the mites and lower them down to ridiculously low thresholds, which is just any opportunity you can get to do that, you're doing your bees such a service in, in your business or even your hobby a service. And getting that new queen in there, queens, young queens just want to lay more. So they put more, they give you more brood going into winter. More winter bees means a bigger cluster coming out of winter. As long as they have enough food, then that's more space that they can keep warm. That's more space that she can lay into. And the quicker they're going to build up. However, some old queens do really good. And we also want to breed for longevity. So I'm looking into a, a method that we're basically, we're taking out the old ones out of our production colonies and making nucleus colonies with them, allowing those to build up through the winter. And if they do a fantastic job, we'll build them up and continue and maybe even look towards maybe even breeding those from those Queens, if they can last for a few seasons. But if you know they come out of winter and they're kind of ho-hum, at least they're not in that big colony where they're holding that big colony back. They're just holding a nuke back. But the other method uh, way of doing that would be leaving the Queens in those colonies and then just splitting, which is kind of what we did this year and making nucleus colonies um, in late August and those splits, even though they're tiny, like kind of like what's Ian is doing up in Canada, you have these nice reserve of insurance colonies, same thing Michael Palmer is doing. It's just good business practice, having those insurance colonies. And okay. So let's say you have this double deep colony and it comes out of winter with seven frames of a bee cluster. And the queen's kind of one of those, and eh, that you're not going to, you might get a little honey off of them, but she's just not going to do anything magical for you because she's just not good enough. Well, you've got these nukes over here that maybe are four or five frames, but they have a great queen and also a, a nice balance of bees go in there and remove that queen and plug that nuke in. And now you have a really nice production colony. So that's your insurance policy. There's a couple ways to slice this, but if you're looking as a, a business, as, as a, this as a business, you've got to keep your queens young if you want consistency, and that's all there is to it. The further south you are, the harder it is on your queens because they lay longer, and that's that's going to shorten their lifespan. So what people do up north doesn't always apply down to the south. I mean, goodness, up north, they might only lay hard for five or six months. You know, my queens start laying pretty good, pretty hard in February, and you know, I've got I've got a decent bit of brood in my hive right now. You know, hives, they're, they're definitely slowing down. Yeah, Ian said some good things about that sunflower pollen. Let's see. Have you tested different types of timber frames to see if the bees have beneficial, if the bees have a beneficial bacteria such as our native timber and Achaia? You know, I have not, I haven't even read hardly anything about that. Um, however, there could be something to it. 
I really don't know. That's another interesting to look into. I think to look into another thing um, I wanted to mention is that, you know, I don't have the address on me at, at hand looking at places to get some high quality equipment. If you're close to Tennessee and there may be some other places around the country that has Amish or Mennonites or um, very reasonably priced equipment, you can get deep boxes of Cypress that are very well made for like $13 in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. You can also get them in Franklin, Kentucky that are made by the Amish and it's, it's much cheaper than what you can get from a professional, um, you know, a big B supplier, professional, um, I guess. However, it, it's a little different for me. A lot of people ask why I went with Man Lake boxes. And a lot of that's because I can get really low prices compared to what, you know, back I used to get when I was buying 20 boxes. You know, now I'm buying several hundreds and, and buying a lot of other stuff, um, compiling it with that. And so, um, but looking... You know, I w- right now, if I bought a one or five boxes from Man Lake, it'd be so expensive. So buying in bulk definitely has its advantages for, for you all who are trying to save, trying to find somebody local, especially if you can get your the Amish folk interested. It's not you're doing them a favor. It's not taking advantage of them. Um, the Amish people, the communities that have these big um, that are, are building the equipment, they really benefit from this. So maybe talking to them about it, showing them, I promise you, there's a person in that Amish community that can totally build all kinds of equipment like that. You would, you would help the, their community out and bring a lot of revenue to them. And also you could get the equipment for a lot less. So um, maybe look into that if you don't have that nearby. All right, let's see here. do, 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 do. I'm 15 years old and thinking about becoming a commercial beekeeper when I graduate instead of an English degree like I was planning. What do you think? Is it a sustainable line of work? I believe it is. Um, however, it's um, – I mean I, I was going to say anything in agriculture is a risk, but anything in life is a risk. Going to college is a risk. There's a lot of people that have college degrees, and I know several of them, and you know they're not even able to make as much money as they thought, or there's not as many career opportunities, or in order to make the money that they wanted to, they're having to leave the place that they wanted to live in order to be able to go out and get that. Um, you know, co- there's a lot of risk with college. Also, the fact of all the college debt. Um, you know, college is for some people. You've got to have it for some type of jobs. Uh, I think it's a little overrated, just in general. Um, because I, I, we can just watch the news and see how many idiots there are in college right now. I think they know how to run uh, the country and uh, don't even know how to hold down a job, most of them. And I promise you the ones that are holding down a job, they're not the ones complaining because they're too busy working and going to school at the same time. I'm sorry about that soapbox, but I totally think that you can do it. But you got to know your business. And I, I can't say as much as what a lot of people could like Bob Benny or Ian about commercial beekeeping. I've, I've never, you know, especially Bob, who's actually trucked bees. If you haven't watched Bob Benny's videos, I recommend you do it. I really like him as a person and as a beekeeper, his videos are great. But the first thing I would do is go see if you could please get a job working for someone like Bob Benny and learn the ropes. You'll save yourself thousands of dollars. And I I honestly think that you can do it, but you're going to have to love it. You're going to have to um, work on those hot days, cold days. I think it's a lot better. Um, But then again, I'm a crazy guy and my parents named me Cayman. So what do I know? Decided to go with the Ergo kit and extra super with wood frames. Thanks. Hey, I um, I, I really like um, what I've seen so far with the app for me. I was really surprised. I uh, When I got into them, I honestly did it just because there wasn't a whole lot of good YouTube videos on them. I wanted to have that content. So whenever anyone looked at app May stuff, I would be, you know, if you look at it right now and you type in app May stuff and look at videos, we're one of the first people that come up because there's just not a lot of competition for them out there. And also wanted to provide some information on for, for beekeepers, even though I seriously doubt I'm ever going to change my operation to that type of equipment. Um, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't need good information on the people that want to use it. Um, by the way, anyone that wants to go through Appame, if you'll go through um, our link, that actually it doesn't cost you a dime more and actually contributes a decent bit to the channel. I appreciate the Appame folks doing that. And by the way, we'll have more details coming up on this in the future, but Appame is donating to the experimental yard to a degree and helping us out. And I'm, I'll be really excited to share more with that about that in the future, which is it's huge because this experimental yard 
if you count the price of the bees, the insulated hives, the wooden equipment, not including the time and just all that stuff, we are talking, oh my goodness, you know, probably between 16, 15 and $18,000. It's a lot. Oh my goodness, Don. I forgot the Alabama game was on tonight. How in the world could I forget Alabama's playing tonight? I don't have TV, but I can, you know, I can at least keep up with the score. <laughs> goodness gracious. They better win that game. That's all I've got to say. Oh, goodness. Can you send me some of let's see what 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 what? Oh, I can take my headphones. No wonder I'm talking so loud. I'm sorry, why are you oh, wow. Jeez. <laughs> can I send you some of my Colorado Queens? Yeah, that is that is a possibility. Um, I tell you, if you, um, it would be, be very interesting to try for sure. Um, how hard is it being on the road and keeping bees at the same time? I'm a trucker and plan on starting my apiary next spring. It is. It can be extremely difficult. Um, you know, you can do it though. I'm um, just don't overshoot your headlights. I'm um, no trucker, trucker pun intended there. I'm just trying to manage too many hives while you're on the road. And again, what I said earlier with Ian, I, I truly believe in my heart of hearts. And I know Ian has said similar things is we both have done this. If you can't manage 10 or five hives successfully, you cannot do any better at 50. You can't do it. All you can do is lose money faster and put more stress on yourself. And I promise you, if you, I know some fantastic fundamental beekeepers who just decided they want 15 hives and they stop there, but they make enough insurance colonies every year. And every year they are producing honey to sell. They're doing exactly what they want to every year. And if they wanted to, I promise you, they would do well at 50 hives or a hundred, but they know what it takes to keep bees healthy and alive. And you can do that truck driving I know a couple guys, I used to do it. Um, my secret weapon though was Laurel. And so I was able to keep a lot more bees than what most truckers would be able to do. If you've got a wife um, that is willing to help, or if you're a woman, you've got a husband that'll contribute, then, I mean, you've got a, a huge advantage there. And, um, you know, all my friends say I'm lucky. I just say that I'm awesome, but nobody believes me. So Laurel's giving me the look like you're lucky and yeah let's just end it let's just she's totally right she's totally right all right um yeah you know you could take your headphones off yeah i saw that yeah or come out with one hundred twenty thousand dollars in debt and that's that's the thing right there is um bees are so dynamic i mean you can you can you can double or triple your operation if you know what you're doing really good and you have the time and the resources and the knowledge to do so you can totally do it bees are that dynamic which makes them fairly profitable. And you can sell honey like crazy right now, um, especially on the, you know, selling in smaller quantities. When you're doing barrels, it's not quite as lucrative unless you're doing massive amounts. So there's a balance there on what your area will provide you. But uh, there's definitely a market for not only pollination, there's a market for nucleus colonies, there's a market for queens, especially if all if you're doing a good job at all these things, you can sell it. So it's not a matter of can you sell the stuff, it's a matter of can you produce it. Yeah, the Apame is like the Swiss Army Knife Hive. It's got a fantastic pollen trap. I can't believe Lane Kiffin has scored that many points on Alabama. I, I tell you what, he drives me nuts. Oi, Laura, could you get me some water? You know, and you know, my dad and my brothers have a totally different line of, of business that, that I'm doing, and my dad's a computer programmer and uh, had to have a college education uh, to get that job. And he's done really good by um, me and my brothers and my mom with that job. And I'm very proud to call him my dad. Um, sometimes he looks at me funny and wonders where I got it from as far as, um, you know, this entrepreneuring spirit and especially fooling with bees, which is really off the, the beaten path of what you, you know, people would do. Um, and my brother, Ethan, but he's, Ethan is a fantastic computer person brilliant with him and it has been since a little kid he was just naturally he was fixing uh, vcrs back you know when 
you know, it was like seven years old. I mean, just that kind of stuff. And, but he, that's what he loved to do. And he stuck with it all those years and he doesn't have a college education. He still does makes a very good living because he's really passionate and really darn good at what he does. And um, I think a lot of it has to do with not giving up and, and just working hard and, um, you know, he had to do some crummy stuff in the meantime and Hayden, he's in the air force. So, I mean, uh, college can be, he's going to college though. Um, so, oh, thank you. My voice is, I'm losing it. Ooh. Invest in your equipment, but grow your bees. I think a lot of it, a lot of the mistakes that I made that cost me the most, you all can learn from if you watch the videos. Ian, I try to be open and honest about that. Like, you know, like 10 years ago, I decided to follow Michael Bush's advice that he was freely sharing that you didn't need to paint your equipment. Let your boxes be natural. It helps the wood breathe more. Um, of course, where he was living, they get a fraction at the time. They get a fraction of the rain that we do. And also, there's a huge difference in areas, um, bacteria and fungi. There are places in the U.S. where things just don't rot very fast. There are places in Tennessee where we just we can rot things so quickly here. It's, it's unbelievable. We rot stuff that's not supposed to rot in Tennessee. It's, it's, it's crazy. A lot of moisture, a lot of fungi and bacteria. Yeah. And then constantly, you know, again, what I like about Ian and I try to, um, I think I'm this type of person as well, just constantly learning. I can't imagine a, a life of ever stopping. It's not just beekeeping. That's one of the reasons why I don't ever see myself growing my business to thousands of colonies is I just don't want that kind of lifestyle. I also really love farming and um, gardening and, and th other things as well. They're kind of what brought me into bees. Um, one guy said, chickens are the gateway to um, beekeeping. That's kind of true. But I, uh, I, I don't care if I live to be 100. I want to be learning more about this kind of stuff. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to learn more from you all as well. So someone was talking about teramycin and, and do I use, and that was further up in this comment right here, kind of brought it to the forefront. I have never used teramycin. Um, I know some beekeepers that use it every year and as a preventative it's just kind of one of those things where I always felt like it was more of a, a, a breeding problem. And some people are like, well, why don't you feel that way about mites? Well, I, I've tried that. I've tried it a bunch and it hasn't worked for me. And like Ian was saying, there's some encouraging stuff that, excuse me, guys like Randy Oliver are doing. Um, and I hope that he's totally successful, man. I hope I'm on here a couple of years from now saying, man, I was totally wrong. We have treatment free bees and they work everywhere, and our bees are thriving. Life seldom is that easy and simple. We might get rid of the row mites and get something else five years later, but things have, things have changed. I mean, think about this. If When bees first came over here, they didn't have wax moss, tracheal mites, different strains of nosema, a lot of these viruses that are really rough. They didn't have the varroa mites. They didn't have small hive beetles. They didn't have a lot of these things. And they all have impacted the colony. They're all stressors, some of them more or less. And they have told, they, they change things and, and it forever impacts. It's kind of like when they brought kudzu down in here and they were recommending everybody to do it to shore up the banks. It's, it's, it's made a lasting impression in a lot of areas around here. And you can see it taking over the whole hillsides. And uh, yeah, once the, the toothpaste is out of the, uh, the container, it's really hard to put it back in. And that's the way it is with Varroa mites and the consequences are, are hard to erase. Um, it, it's a serious problem. And anyone who's thinking about treatment free or who is and watches my stuff, it's not that it, I'm mad at you for doing it. It's not that at all. I'm mad at myself for my failures and what it cost me and my family and how many bees I lost trying that. And that's, that's why I kind of get a little bit um, up in arms all about it. But um, Cayman Reynolds does not know everything. And I would, I would love to be proven wrong, but the, my biggest, my biggest beef with the treatment free crowd are the ones who are extremely belligerent about everybody needs to do it is it's kind of goes back to the whole thing I was talking about. And you and I were talking about farming is the fact that, yes, I truly think that we need to have cleaner farming and more eco-friendly farming. And I, I promise you, Ian would love nothing more than that. Uh, most 
any any farmer is going to be that way. They want the best for the land as well. A lot of times they just don't know the way there. And a lot of times the people who are shouting at them to fix it don't know a way there either. But the same way with the treatment-free crowd is that, okay, so some of you have these treatment-free bees, but how are you going to be able to get that to where it'll work for me and it'll work for everybody that is watching this right now and that it'll work every time and, and take out the virus. How, how are you going to actually make this idea work? And, and I followed all of them for several years and purchased from guys who are known for it and it did not work. It cost me lots of money. So, um, you know, that's all I've got to say on that. Again, I'd like to be wrong. Let's see here. My dad's probably having a heart attack on that, that football game, I'd say. Let's see. You know, and see, you know, Denver family kennel says, I never treated my bees and no loss after three years so far. You know, and I'm not saying that you're a liar or anything. I'm not. But all I can tell you is my experiences. And if I purchased, whether it was from a treatment-free guy that's what he said anyways and i did that multiple times or whether it's from commercial strains or from swarms that i got into trees if i put in a hundred hives and did nothing for mites but took care of everything else i would expect to lose 70 percent every year and it, i mean it's not like i did it one year it's like I, I had this happen multiple years back to back and just it just kept it just kept going and there was no end in sight it didn't matter whose genetics i had if I use small cell foundation or even tried some IPM management drone comb removal, it's not that those things didn't have an effect or using something like powdered sugar, um, which was all the rage over a decade ago. It just, it's got to work. And uh, I never, never worked for me. And there's too many guys that I know and trust that say that's, that's that way for them. And, you know, that's, that's just my experience. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe there is. I mean, and let's see. Just like you and Ian, I started treatment free and lost over fifty percent of my colonies for five years in a row in Ontario, Canada. I found I had mites and nosema issues like crazy, and that's and that's the thing is when I finally sat down and said, "Hey, we I've got to get to the bottom of this, or just throw in the towel." It's it's costing me too much. It's, it's cost me all this time, and at the at the end of the the year, I mean, there's I got nothing to show for it a little bit of debt, if anything. And once you start actually monitoring, you know, the alcohol washes, you start really focusing on this stuff a lot more. I think a lot of people, I, I see it on Facebook constantly. And I mean, I get so many questions on this and I wish I could answer every question. It's just totally impossible. People asking why their bees have died or why they've absconded or why is there only 200 or 400 bees left in the hive? They were there a couple of weeks ago. Classic case of viruses that were induced by mites. Bees should not be absconding this time of the year in most parts of the country. It's not hot enough to cause them to abscond. If, it, if they're weak enough that yellow jackets or something like that could have impacted them, maybe. But, you know, I, I, I opened up a hive yesterday, and this is the first one I've seen at the, to this level. It had 200 hive beetles in there. It must have had 200 hive beetles in there. It's an awesome looking colony if you take the beetles out. Most of my colonies right now, my big ones, I'd say are running somewhere between 30 and 50 hive beetles. Haven't used any treatments for them so far this year, but um, I did some last year. I'll, I'll get onto those eventually. I just haven't had time. And, and you know, it's just, I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. Doggone it. Uh, you're checking these things, just keeping an eye on what is actually going into the colonies. And once I started actually paying attention to what was happening at the end of the year, it made big impacts. And these folks that you know are questioning me, asking me what, why do my bees leave and all this stuff? It, it's weird how I used to do this. The treatment-free crowd is the first to point. Oh, it's European foul brood. Oh, it's wax moss. Oh, it's yellow jackets. Oh, it's this. And I understand a lot of these people are brand new that are saying this. So I mean, there's a lot of people that are experienced that don't that are treatment-free that don't say this. But um, I do know some that are fairly experienced and like, man, I'm seeing European foul brood, European foul brood just wiped out 80% of my bee yards. And I'm like, there's some viruses out there that are induced from Varroa 
that give you European foul brood looking symptoms and even, and even European foul brood symptoms. European foul brood is in every one of our hives. It's in your hives right now. There's different strains of it. And some bees are more resilient to it than others. And if your bees are, are getting plagued by mites and viruses, those stressors are going to make things like European foul brood that may not have been a factor before rear their ugly head. And a lot of people get ticked off because guys like me are the first thing we point to is mites. But that is because 90 something percent of the time, that's, that's what it is. And it's super frustrating. Um, you know, like the oxalic acid, um, that one, I, that one's really thrown me for the loop over the last couple of years. I'm, I'm tinkering around with a couple of things right now on efficiency rates of trying to take what treatments we have legally to use and making them as most as effective for me as possible, which I hope will maybe translate into easier or better success for you all. That's one of the reasons I want this experimental yard so much is mainly for, for ROA understanding, not only understanding the treatments that we use for them, but eventually understanding maybe treatment free bees. And I would love to see if we could, if we could kind of get an idea on the treatments that we're using first and see how, when, what's causing issues with them, because there's a lot of treatments that are having issues. They're either not killing good enough or they're damaging bees. Apivar, which is, man, there's just no treatment out there you can trust fully, but you know, Ian swears by, and there's a lot of guys that do, there's, there's too many, there's so many inconsistencies with Apivar and I've seen it within my bee yards and y'all have some hives that, I mean, just they get cleaned up and there's just clean as a whistle with varroa mites. And there's some that I'll use Apivar and I'll do the mite washes later. I'm just like, what in the world? And some people are like, it's resistance to the amitraz. And I, I have seen nothing to prove that. Um, actually, there's been science done on amitraz and resistance. And actually everything right now is pointing to there is no resistance to it. And, and these are some operations that have thousands of colonies that use amitraz yearly and not showing any legitimate sign of resistance to it. So maybe I, I personally think any issues with that is a concentration issue in the apivar strips. Also, apivar is a slow kill when the bees have lots of brood. And every treatment works better when the bees are broodless. But I'm seeing some colonies that have, you know, decent mite loads. You throw the strips in four strips, which is, you know, the recommended dose. And you're, they're coming out. And yes, it has slowed them down significantly and, and most of the time dropped them back a little bit. But then you come back a couple, you know, a month and a half after treatment and they're way up again because it didn't knock them back by 95% like you hoped it would. It only knocked them back by 80%. And they multiply fast. Citric acid for mites. I've never heard anything about that um, being utilized for mites. I know that there's um, acetic acid and a few other things that have been used, but um, I, I don't know anything about citric acid for mite control. So what is better, oxalic acid in liquid form or fumigating to combat the mites? And right now, I would have to say that it's, it's kind of a, a toss-up, and it really depends. So in my experience... The dribble, which is in liquid form, is typically a longer lasting kill. You, it, it's, it's better as far as eliminating the mites, but also have some issues with that. And I'll, I'll address that in one second. Dribble is two different things that I'm aware of. It's either in a glycerin form or it's in a sugar syrup suspension where basically you mix the oxalic acid in sugar syrup or glycerin. And then look, they call it seams of bees, but basically if you're looking at your hive, you have your frames and in between those frames, you have your bees and those are called seams of bees. And depending on the concentration, you have dosage and you, you need to be very precise with this, this stuff. If you apply a lot of it, because it doesn't take much per seam, then it can be rough on the colony. That's the biggest problem with the dribble is that it can be a little hot if you apply too much or if you apply, uh, put a lot of oxalic acid in it. However, it gives me great knockback, especially when they're broodless, it just wipes them out. Um, and it, it kills, in my opinion, for at least, I think at least double the time the oxalic acid vapor does. However, it can be a little rougher and it's also more irritating to apply because it's so, you, you have to get it just right. You can't just go and just spritz away. You end up applying two or three times the quantity and, and it, it'll, uh, 
burn your bees up. And the sugar syrup, actually, if there's not an incoming natural source of nectar or you're not feeding them clean sugar um, syrup with no oxalic acid in it for the dribble, then they will actually try to consume the oxalic acid um, syrup. And that is really rough on their guts. So that's the biggest problem with dribble. That's why if I was going to um, integrate that into my program consistently, I would totally go the vegetable glycerin route because they will not try to eat it. The, um, the oxalic acid vapor is definitely faster, not as um, precise as far as having to measure stuff out and that kind of thing. However, it, it kills for a shorter period of time. So um, I, I see merit to both of those, especially when the beads are broodless. Um, they both work pretty well. But if I had to pick, if someone asked me, if my beads are broodless, which of these two would be better? I would go for the dribble. You're going to get a better kill in one shot. However, the vapor is faster. And um, it's more gentle typically on the bees. So I would, if you're wanting to be more gentle and you're okay with coming back a couple times, I would do two rounds of oxalic acid, even if they were broodless. I just don't feel like it gives me 90% kill, like a lot of people say. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, let's see. Um, thank you, Melissa Crumpton, for donating to our channel. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, um, leave it below. Yeah, Marathon Beekeeping Show, um, it's what it feels like. Um, you know, especially having Ian on, it just went by so fast. I've wanted to talk to him for a long time. Um, just, you know, we just don't have a lot of free time to be able to have, you know, especially this long of a conversation. You know, he's always busy and I, I keep pretty busy. Um, not as busy as he does, um, but I, I, not too far away. And, uh, you know, I just I really enjoyed that. I, I really hope to have him on again. I think that he's open to doing that. Maybe focus more on just questions and answers, kind of like what I'm doing, but just um, kind of having Ian and I both on. And that, I think that would be quite a bit of fun. But it was really nice to get to just hear more about Ian himself and just kind of how he does things, get a little perspective, as he likes to say. And uh, let's see if I can say that like him. No, I just totally can't. I say Poland. Ian's probably not on right now, so I can say whatever I want. I saw a comment on how a beekeeper places trays with cooking oil underneath their screen bottom boards, and they have no they have no mite problems and no beetle problems. Um, you know, the, the mites are extremely <laughs> proficient at what they do. They they if they fall off the bees, it's almost always because they're old or something's wrong with them. There are some bees out there that are supposed to maul the mites a little bit. And there is some data showing this, um, but it's very minute. And um, it's just how much that actually works and to what extent I have seen bees pick up a mite before with their mandibles, but it was already dead. So are they beating them up in the process of removing them out of the hive? And what's, and if they're doing a little bit of both, what's the percentages? It, there's just so much work to be done in that area. Okay. So two bees in a podcast, there's several podcasts out there and I've, I've started listening to a, a couple periodically when I have a chance and whenever I listen to something, it's not being selfish. I don't think, um, whenever I listen to something, I, I want one of two things. I want education or I want entertainment and preferably both. And we try to do that here. We, we try to be helpful and we try to entertain um, as boneheaded as some of the jokes are. And some of these podcasts that I've been listening to that I can't, I can't stay on with them consistently. I just feel like because it's, it's either they have scientists on left and right, which, Hey, we need those guys, but goodness data gets boring after a while. And I really want something that I can take home to my bees and either make me understand my bees better or make me make my bees healthier. I want things that are going to make impacts. And I feel like some of these podcasts are doing that. And I've, I just haven't stumbled across one that I've been able to stay hooked on to, but I have not tried that one. So I will do that. Let's see here. Let's see here. Oh, wrong button. Man, I, these electronic devices. Bless you, Laurel. Thank you, Wallace Beehives. Um, she really was trying to hold it back, but she lost combustion. Sometimes you just can't help it. No, I don't know any of the ADs um, at all. Um, I know people who know them, and that's a, I mean, that's just what they do on a commercial scale is just insane. 
Hey, Canadian Tropicana, thanks for coming on. It was really nice chatting with you as well. Yeah, um, let's see. What do you feel like the kill rate is on our strips on a 42 days plus? Man, it, it's really hard to know. And that's, again, why I want this trial um, yard to get a better picture because I need to know. I mean, we're we're hedging our livelihood on something. We I hate being blind about it. I mean, especially if there's any inconsistencies there. And there are beekeepers who are more experienced than I. Um, Bob Benny has mentioned this and others as well that have mentioned if, issues with Apivar. And I've seen some of it. And I'm just wondering, is it that it does not handle high mite loads and brings them down if there's a lot of brood? Because I, I truly believe that with Apivar. If you have high loads and you stick the strips in, it's not going to fix it for you fast enough. It's just not going to do it. Okay. But... Um, I have had some good success with it as well, especially making colonies that are splits that have a big gap, either a complete brood break, or they've just, when you split them, you've, you've broke the colony up. And so there's a little bit of a hiccup there. And that just, that just makes it any treatment more effective when you do that. Excuse me, but there definitely is some issues with Apivar, but there is issues with every treatment out there. We've got to get to the bottom of this. I'm tired of, the question marks that lie in with any of these treatments. And I would preferably like to not use Apivar. I'd like to get away from that. So um, in order to do that, we're going to have to learn more about the efficiency rate of these natural products. Um, let's see. I saw a comment. Uh... Hey, Jeff. Thank you so much again. I hope you have a good night's sleep. And um Hey, congratulations on your Arkansas Razorbacks winning a football game. I was I was really excited for you. And thanks for the donation, Jeff. You're you're a really champ a champion. So Bo Lash is like, how do you treat oxalic acid in an Apame hive caiman? Well, I don't have a way of just like sticking it in and holding it um, for you. And just you can walk away for a second or two. You can just open up one of those holes and bl blast it in. What I would do first is just blast some smoke in there and move some bees out of the way. And then make sure you have your, your board in the bottom because that seals it really nice and keeps those fumes up into the colony. And just uh, just hold it there. I mean, especially if you have a, a, a John O Easy Vap or a Pro Vap or something along those lines, you're only going to be holding it there for maybe 20 seconds. Now, if you have a pan vaporizer, things get a little bit more interesting. You're going to have to build an insert underneath and let it come up in the um, screen bottom board of the FMA hive, but you totally can do it. How many hives are you can, do you have to have to be considered commercial? And man, that is a, that's total speculation. Depends on which country you're in. Also depends on what kind of a person you are. I have seen so many commercial guys. They're like, oh man, you're not a real commercial beekeeper. You only have a thousand hives. <laughs> and then there's, there's guys that have 4,000 hives that are um, being kind of made fun of by some of the guys that run 10 or 15,000. You know, there's some guys that don't even say stuff like that. They're very kind and considerate. Y'all only hear the stuff from the, the ones that are rough around the edges, but that's a matter of opinion. And my opinion on commercial beekeeping is if you're making a, a sizable part of your living, moving bees around for pollination or honey production. Um, you're, you're moving your bees around. Um, there's a lot of people like Michael Palmer who runs well over a thousand colonies and does not truck his bees around to other states. And, you know, some people would call that commercial beekeeping. Um, I mean, you can definitely make that argument. I, I more consider that professional beekeeping myself. I, in my eyes, I see commercial beekeeping as moving bees around a lot from flow to flow or to going after pollination contracts. But um, as far as numbers, some people are really creative and it all depends on what you want, but it's like there are folks that make a pretty sizable living off of just a couple hundred hives, but they're really good at marketing their honey online and other places getting high dollar for their product. And it's like folks in Hawaii selling um, that rare Kiave honey for, you know, $20 for, you know, a little thing like this. Now it is really special and quite the treat. And I think everyone should try it at least once, but it's, um, you know, it's all about marketing and stuff. So it depends. 
have you tried formic pro for mites and you know i have used formic acid in the past but it's always been mite away quick quick strips except i have used formic pro a couple times but it was for colonies that i wanted to get rid of because they had i've done this twice the mites were way too um not only were the mites high but the viruses were just crazy and um I, I, there's no saving some of these colonies. I tried to, I try to requeen them, try to clean it up. It was becoming an issue and I didn't want that in my bees. Um, and just drop some formic on some hot days. It's a good way to get rid of some colonies. And um, that's what I use formic pro, but I, I don't have any experience. I'm really planning on using formic for this experimental yard though, trying to better understand how we can use a natural treatment like that. And, um, keep our co combs and honey and everything as pure and clean as possible, um, but also killing those mites and keeping our bees healthy. Yeah, I'm just going to turn over here. So let's see here. If you take time and scratch the plastic strips, they will last just about whatever. See, Wade, um, I, I heard um, some of that going around, but um, Randy Oliver actually kind of uh, debunked that a little bit. Um, and some people are saying if you scratch them, it will make them more viable again. Um, Randy Oliver did a small test and it was in a closed environment with bees that were pulled out of the hive, old strips, um, put them in there and it killed the mites. However, I mean, it's one, it's, um, it, I wouldn't recommend people rubbing the strips again and, and reusing them because it's um i don't think it's effective i think even fresh strips aren't as effective sometimes as they need to be um, in high mite load um, areas and the test that he did was in a completely brewless environment it was a small closed experiment and then on top of that um again the mites were on bees that had no brood nothing else and there could have been some other things going on there impacting you know the mite fall so I just, I don't know. Um, the main thing we, we definitely don't want to do is Apivar is the only synthetic treatment that I'm aware of right now that actually does something. Um, the other couple ones that are out there, the, the mites are pretty well immune to. I don't even think they should be able to be, able, be, able to be sold. But the, uh, you know, the Apivar, if we lose that, some people will be glad about it because they want things to be more natural. And I understand that to a degree. But felt like I needed to sneeze there for a second. It's going to come on here in a second. Laurel's spread it to me. <laughs> but if we lose that treatment, it's going to really impact the industry. But we need to we need to not just plan on relying on that. And that's, again, why this experimental yard is here, is what is it going to take to keep our bees successfully, consistently natural? And that's the biggest question I want to address for the experimental yard. The second biggest question is insulation. I have seen some really promising stuff from the insulated hives that I have here. Obviously, if your bees are in terrible health, it doesn't matter if you have them in the best hive in the world. But I think healthy colonies can do some pretty cool things. And I'm seeing some neat stuff. Oh, my. Um, Laurel gave me kind of that look that came in. You said you wouldn't be on this long. And you, you did it again. I'm actually losing my voice a little bit. I've been talking more than just on the live chat today. I've, my eyes are a little bloodshot, Laurel says. I've been talking probably for five hours today. You know, thankfully, Ian spotted me, so it wasn't as bad today. Um, but everybody, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. I, looking I look forward to learning more from you and sharing more with you in the future. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for your time. Thanks for um, helping support um, Ian as well, coming on to here. And and none of us are perfect. None of us have it all figured out, but working together, we can, we can, yeah, I'm, my voice is really going. My voice isn't perfect. That's for sure. I've lost the, the sultry sound that Laurel loves to hear. Yeah, it was, I know, no, I know I had a tea full of some of the um, honey that somebody sent us from Kansas and um, Don Bearden sent us some honey um, we got some honey from Missouri and Alabama and Ohio. We got all kinds of different stuff. I'll, I'll show more of that later. I'm going to try to get a wall back here, but oh my goodness, we will have another live chat before too long. And thank you guys so, so much. You guys are the best. We'll see you later.